All right. Welcome to our April 9th, 2024, uh, Board of County Commission meeting. Uh, Commissioner Campy will be tardy, so we'll let him know that when he gets here. <laughs> um, we're going to start off with an invocation from Pastor Aaron Meehan uh, from Higher Purpose Pentecostal Church, uh, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, uh, led by Captain Wayne Hanners from the uh, U.S. Navy veteran. Thank you again. I'm Aaron Meehan from Higher Purpose Pentecostal Church. I appreciate the invitation. Um, <clears throat> before I pray, I'd like to just say one quick thing. Uh, on the way here, I was thinking of a principle I learned in church, but then learned in business school, and that's the idea of an organizational pyramid. At the top, you've got the leaders. At the bottom, the base. Those are the constituents. There's different levels of management in between. At business school, they taught us that you need to flip that upside down because our perspective is often the leaders are at the top, they sit pretty up there, but in actuality, the organizational pyramid is upside down, the leaders are often at the bottom holding everything else up, right? And so our leaders have great responsibility and a great burden on their shoulders. You all have a great responsibility today for your constituents and all the business that's going to be uh, taking place today. So I'd like to, in my prayer, pray specifically for you, for your role in this, also to pray for this group of people that we can do this in order, with peace, and we are all here for the same purpose, and that is to better our local government and our city and our county. So if you could, let's bow our heads right now and let's pray. We thank you for this opportunity to come and better our county. We pray that you would bless this council meeting. You would bless all of these leaders, Lord God, these commissioners. Help us, Lord God, to foster an environment of peace in this place. Let us do, Lord, what is best for our county and our people. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. My name is Wayne Hanners. I, if you are a veteran, by presidential proclamation, you are allowed to give a hand salute. Please join me in a pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You can please stay up and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is Wayne Hanners. I'm retired from the United States Navy. I served 20 years in the Navy from 1971 to 1991. I served on six different naval vessels. That's including into the Pacific and also to the Mediterranean. Also one time home ported in Athens, Greece for the Sixth Fleet. From there, I, was, I changed my job. I was a machinist first in the Navy my first 10 years. And from there, then I went in, was selected to go into permanent recruiting duty in a new J Navy job called Navy Counselor Crew Recruiting Force. From there, I served at five Navy recruiting districts. Navy Recruiting District Miami, Jacksonville, San Diego, Memphis and retired at Navy Recruiting Unit at Houston. I had my ceremony on the bow of the battleship Texas in Houston Harbor, which was a wonderful day. It just came out of the shipyards. Hmm. But during my naval career, it was an honor to serve. I, do, I was deployed many times. Like I say, most of these were six-month cruises. But from the, my Navy training brought me on into the civilian career. And after retiring from the Navy, I became a private yacht captain in New York, uh, New Jersey and also here in Florida. Uh, did numerous trips. My time in the Navy, I was able to visit 37 different countries, and since then I've been to 57 different countries. So I'm pretty world, world, world traveled uh, by the grace of God and the fellowship of the Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I had a commanding officer jerk a knot in my butt one day and got my attention and says, you gotta do something about your problem. I was one of those that uh, walk like a sailor, talk like one, and drink like one. And I did it pretty well until I was held accountable for my actions. But to this day, I've got 44 years of sobriety. 
Thank you, God, for that. It's been a pleasure to serve my country. I'm also an active member of the Reverence Motorcycle Group. We render honors. We do a lot of stuff with uh, Congressman Mast. Uh, we do funerals, but we're your local uh, motorcycle group that honors strictly 100% veterans and first responders. I'm also a member of the Treasure Coast Hospice Veterans Honors Program, and that's been a pleasure. I go and visit veterans either in IPU at end of life, nursing homes, or in their own homes, and do an honor ceremony with them. Where we give them a, a blanket knit by some of our church group ladies. I give them also some certificates, a challenger coin, and a, and a uh, flag, and thank them so much for their service. And that's been a, a God's grace to be able to do that because these guys have sometimes have never been recognized, but I've visited over 80 veterans so far in the last three years. And at Christmas time, it was a real honor to go and deliver Christmas cards to these gentlemen in, in the uh, assisted livings and nursing homes. But thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, today we have 505 public comment, and then we have a preset um, at 1030 staff presentation of the history of Bathtub Beach, uh, 505 public comment. Additional items, um, consent 17, U.S. Sailing Center of Martin County request for special use permit, and Department 4, uh, 2024 legislative session final report. Uh, we have no consent polls. And I will take uh, Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to move approval of the agenda with the additional items of consent item 17 and department 14, uh, as well as no additional polls. I will second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Smith, seconded by Commissioner Hetherington. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes four to zero, zero with Commissioner Campy absent. And with that, we will move to um, public comment. And we are going to start with Wayne Hanners. And if I've mispronounced your name, um, please let me know. Followed by Gary Bradzinski. Uh, before you speak, I just want to, you, so you're quite all right. Uh, since we are in election season, politicking is prohibited, which is defined as advocating the election or defeat of a candidate for public office, either partisan or nonpartisan. This includes words, dates, signs, props, and or wearing apparel that convey a message of support for a person or group of persons. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, commissioners, once again. And thank you so much for inviting me this morning to do the pledge. I want to clear one thing. I'm not a Navy captain. I was retired as a chief petty officer from the United States Navy. The captain come from private yachts. So clarify that. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Commissioner Campy, even though he's not here with us here today, uh, for inviting me to do the pledge this morning. And also, Mr. Campy, for the uh, veteran flags that he placed on Map Road in Palm City. And if you haven't had the chance to see them, please drive through Palm City and see all the flags. Uh, my picture's there. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Things I'd like to bring to the board's uh, awareness is that I'm a motorcycle rider. And about eight months ago, I was traveling eastbound on Martin Highway. And about probably 75 yards in front of me, a Royal Palm Fron fell onto the highway. Thank God I was in a right-hand lane, and it didn't hit me, but I was able to swerve and avoid it. Please consider what you plant in these islands. That could have been a <coughs> devastating accident from something. Most of those roll palms are anywhere from 40 to about 80 pounds in weight, and that would be a hazard even to a car coming through a windshield. But please give that in consideration to construction on the medians around town, and that's not the only place that's got these roll palms. Another thing that it's come to my attention is the speed on Martin Highway between Map Road and Martin Downs is at 35 miles an hour. A lot of people say that's because of school zone. Well, that's only an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon. I talked to Mike DeTalese, former commissioner, 
And he said that that was the first set because when uh, Martin Highway was made, the neighborhoods like uh, Danforth and stuff like that had no light to be able to progress onto Martin Highway. Those all neighborhoods now have red lights and everything else, and we're also a four lane instead of a two lane. Um, it's kind of crazy to be at that speed when it's 45 on both sides of of that same road on uh, going to eastbound or westbound from map over the bridge or to, uh, towards Citrus. Um, I wish this would be changed to 40. I was stopped a couple years ago when it was that 35 by a police officer and he says, I don't ride anybody uh, just under 45 miles an hour. He said, I agree, it's kind of crazy at 35 through that zone. So please consider him changing that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Bradzinski. <clears throat> It's followed by Catherine Glover. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking again in regards to the request by uh, Voyage Recovery for accommodation to increase the number of beds in their sober living facility uh, in South Martin County. I reviewed hundreds of documents in the medical literature with the search words of best practice, best number of beds, bed density, bed number, resident density, patient number, best practices, resident number. There's nothing to suggest that more beds are better than fewer beds for the patient. In fact, the studies that address this were a 2010 study by Polson et al. that says that we could not directly compare which type of SLS was most effective. And in the subsequent studies, still trying to make a case, a 2023 study, just last year reported by Subaran et al., found that the number of beds in the SLH was not significant as related to abstinence and psychiatric symptoms over time. What was observed, however, and spoken to as a downside were the conflicts that may occur over chores, noise levels, personal boundaries, and some might struggle with co coexisting with others who may have different lifestyles and personalities, end of quote. So what is improved? I read the industry blogs that insurance revenue is gleaned from urine testing, and that's where the money is. The more residents, the more tests. And even this is more disturbing, that once the insurance coverage for a particular individual runs out, it starts again if that patient relapses. So it can go on forever. So you're actually not incentivized to help the patient recover, you're incentivized financially to make them relapse. The insurance set for urine tests is 150 to $200 a shot for point of care testing. And if you send it off for confirmatory testing, another 1,500 to $2,000 a shot for a urine test. The Delray Mayor, Kerry Glickstein said, it's a perfect business model. It's not a recovery industry, it's a relapse business. Real estate agents are also advertising properties now with reference to how many beds the homes can hold. Out of state inquiries from frantic parents looking for addiction help on helplines are steered to patients who are who, people who are actually marketers who get $1,000 to $5,000 a head for anybody that they've referred to this industry. An article researched and reported by the Palm Beach Post concluded that at $1 billion annually, substance abuse is Palm Beach County's fourth largest industry. Is that what we want from Martin County? I refer you to statistics, some of which I quote from a 2017 paper by Vogel in Treatment and Recovery magazine. In Del Rey, I quote, in 2016, first responders went out on 1,400 overdose calls, about four a day, and nearly 95% were generated by out-of-state occupants of sober houses and treatment centers. 65 ended up in fatalities. Mayor Major Martin County Chief Deputy John Budenseek reported in May, February 16th that there's an uptick in residential burglaries and gated and affluent communities starting in the That's south. Sir, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Catherine, Catherine Glover is followed by Barbara Urich. Hi there. Uh, Dr. Arnold Merriam, he's a professor emeritus in psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, has emailed you all with his medical opinion regarding Voyager Inc.'s reasonable accom accommodation application. These are Dr. Merriam's and our concerns. In Voyager's request to grant reasonable accommodation, they cite literature from the Oxford House model that describes benefits to larger numbers of people in recovery living in any one residence. This article, this argument is medically invalid. The Oxford House model is one in which residents voluntarily establish cooperative, drug-free residences, 
governing their own homes and sharing expenses. It is a nonprofit organization with 501 C3 status. Obviously, having a democratically run home and sharing living expenses means the Oxford House model benefits from having more than four residents. Voyage's model is the complete opposite. It is a for-profit facility used as temporary housing for a treatment program, governed by the operators of that program and supervised by its staff. Rather than providing a group home where people in recovery can help each other, Voyage advertised this property as a country house to promote its treatment services in Jupiter. The more residents they can sign up for their programs using this property as a draw, the more profits they can make. Their comparisons are a deceptive, misleading, and cynical attempt to convince our officials that they need accommodation and have Martin County help them make more money than would otherwise be allowed. Dr. Merriam's email notes that the medical literature that speaks to any advantage or disadvantage to larger or smaller populated sober houses, such as Voyage aims to operate, is sparse. He did reference an article in the Journal of Substance, Substance Abuse Treatment that found that clients living in smaller homes fared no worse than those living in larger ones. Based on his experience and review of the literature, Dr. Merriam's medical opinion is quite contrary to Voyage's claims. Scientific lit lit literature does not support any advantage to the health outcomes of addicted clients living in homes greater than four clients. Voyage has intentionally misled Martin County in its argument to be granted the reasonable accommodation request. They bought this property knowing it was zoned for occupancy by four unrelated people and now claim that they can't use it for their intended purpose without housing many times that number there. They have distorted the truth to try to obtain special allowances that no other taxpaying business or resident would ever be given if they bought an unsuitable property and tried to get around existing zoning. This may not be the first case of this happening in Martin County, but I can assure you that if you run away from this program problem, for whatever reason, it won't be the last. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Is Peter Ur Urich? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Barbara Yurick. I'm here today also to speak about the Voyage Recovery Center. Let's talk about the law. In, U in 42 U.S. Code 3604, the court held that a reasonable accommodation must be needed and necessary. The obligation of the governmental entity requires that the reasonable accommodation be made only when it is necessary to allow a person with a qualifying disability equal opportunity to use and enjoy the dwelling. There's that word necessary again. Hence, in the qu question number six of the uh, Voyager's application says, what are the reasons that make this request necessary? Voyager answers with referencing five studies which I personally looked up each and every one of them. Some of them 40 some odd pages long, I read every word. Not one of them concluded that having more clients, in this case 12 is better than four, is necessary for a client's recovery. Did Martin County staff members look at all these studies? If you should, and if you're not, I'll email them to you because I copied them, I'll e email them to you. Did, re did Voyager um, prove that the increase in clients was necessary? No, they didn't. There's not one study that I could find, nor all of my other folks here, that can show that more is better than less. Not one. Furthermore, there is a law that provides for an exception for the health, safety, and property of others. Per 42 U.S. Code 3604 F9, the county is not required to approve a reasonable accommodation request if it would constitute a direct threat to the health or safety of other individuals or those tendencies would result in the substantial physical damage of properties of others. We have provided the county with over 230 concerned residents' signatures and letters and and Martin County staff has provided ample evidence that by approving an increase in the clients from 4 to 12 will in fact result in the direct threat and the health and safety of other individuals. In the county's request for more information on the application, I don't understand why they focused on licenses, certifications, building codes, code violations, sewer capacity, no permits, pool violations, all of which are secondary items that if it fixed, it still doesn't resolve the issue of the law. 
let's focus on the law. The law is, is basically there is no need and there is no necessity and there is a direct threat to the health and the safety of the other individuals. So for these two reasons on this application should be denied based on the fact that the applicant did not provide any proof of necessity that 12 is better than 4 and number two based on the fact presented regarding that there is in fact a direct threat to the health and safety of other individuals. Thank you. Peter Errich, that's okay. That's followed by Pat. Oh, here's a good one. Um, Squawky. Thank you. Ready? Yep. All right. Good morning, and thank you again for allowing me to speak to you today. My name is Peter Yerk, and I am still the president of the Mooring Safety Harbor Homeowner Association of 162 Homes. However, I am here as a private citizen. My neighborhood consists of many seasoned citizens as well as young families with small children. I now have more signatures, 230 at last count, and still more to come from surrounding neighborhoods signed to express deep concern regarding a young man's recovery center located directly on the west and east sides of our neighborhoods. The folks on my right are also here in support. While I reluctantly accept the business located at 18890 Southeast Jupiter Road, and I understand that the ADA has federal jurisdiction regarding this business. The Martin County, Florida commissioners and supporting staff may influence the headcount of the facility at Jupiter Road. Voyage's request to increase headcount from 5 to 10 or possibly 12 uh, patients must be denied. And what, and what could be coming next? 10 to 15, 15 to 20. And let us not forget that Martin County Code number 3.75D reads, a recovery facility shall not be located within 10 miles of another such facility. Voyage runs a home at 18083 Southeast Federal Highway in Tequesta, only 6.1 miles away via County Line Road. Again, the homeowners and surrounding neighborhoods of the county house respectfully, I'm sorry, the country house respectfully request that Martin County deny Voyage's request for reasonable accommodation as the applica applicant has not proven need nor is the facility built to accommodate. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Um, Pat Sawicki, and if that's not right, please uh, clarify that, <laughs> followed by Terry Cole. Thank you. We skip a few letters. We say Swicky. Okay. Good morning. I'm, I'm here to speak in reference to the proposed or the discussed um, um, uh, passenger or rather pedestrian bridge over the Brightline tracks. When Brightline Railways was built with the minimally required safety equipment required by law, it was built with the minimally required safety equipment. Since it began operations, it has been plagued with an overwhelming number of train strikes, injuries, and death. On January 13th, 2024, the NTSB announced it was going to do a safety inspection of the Brightline Railroad system in the Melbourne area after there were three deaths from train strikes within one week at, at the same railroad crossing. The three January 13 deaths in Melbourne that week marked at least 108 deaths since Brightline began operations in July 2017. That is one death for approximately every 38,000 miles of train tracks, the worst death rate among the nation's more than 800 railroads. Sarah Taylor Solek of SCBNB stated, investigators will work to better understand the safety issues at this crossing and will examine opportunities to prevent or mitigate these crashes in the future. Future. On February 124, there was another fatality in Vero Beach, and on February 16th, Vero Beach had a second fatality. On March 20, and by early March, nine persons had been killed by the Brightway Rail System in this year alone, earning a distinction as the deadliest train system in the United States thus sparking further inquiries by the NTSB into the Bright Life Safety Standards. 
Almost immediately following the NTSB inspection and before the NTSB preliminary report was released, Brightline announced it will be installing approximately $45 million in safety fencing and other safety enhancements along its track lines in Bradford and Miami-Dade counties. Currently, there were approximately, excuse me, currently there are almost weekly train strikes with vehicles and pedestrians. In Martin Kent and St. Louis counties, there were two within the past week alone. On Thursday, one in Martin County, and on Monday, one in St. Lucie County. No parts of Martin, St. Lucie, uh, Indian River counties have any safety fencing now being installed by Brightline, such as that in Brevard and Miami-Dade area. Here in Port Salerno, we have the additional unique distinction of having four railroad crossings with a very short distance. When the 30 plus a day trains pass through the already bottleneck Dixie Highway traffic, all traffic comes to a standstill, often causing traffic to back <coughs> up beyond St. Beyond Lucie Boulevard. When that occurs, emergency vehicles from Martin County Firehouse cannot get out. They are stuck there with lights flashing, sirens blaring, while the bottleneck tra traffic scrambles to allow passage of the stalled ambulance and fire trucks needing passage over the railroad tracks or north. Ma'am, ma your time is up. Thank you. Um, Terry Cole, followed by Michael Circus. Kogo. I'm actually uh, finishing off what Pat has just been going through. Okay, when that occurs, emergen emergency vehicles from Martin County Firehouse cannot get out. They are stuck there with lights flashing, sirens blaring, while the bottleneck traffic scrambles to allow passage of the stalled ambulance or fire trucks needing passage over the railroad tracks or north or south on Dixie Highway. In an industry where seconds count, valuable life-saving time is struck in traffic because of bright line right-of-way. There are few and many life-threatening and or life-taking incidents surrounding the bright line train in our area. Is it any wonder that it has earned the dubious nickname as being the death train? The current safety investigations now being conducted on the federal level are a start to helping resolve these issues and hopefully preventing further inquiries, injuries, and deaths. At this time, Brightline has acknowledged its possibility culpability within the Brevard Miami Dade area by initiating the installation of fencing along its, uh, its along its railway lines within those areas. It is doing so by obtaining state grants and via its own expense for the proposed 45 million safety improvements. Their needed safety improvements are not being financed by the cities, the towns or the counties that Brightline travels through. The citizens of Brevard and Miami-Dade and other counties are not being called upon to foot the bill for Brightline to improve the 100-year-old style railroad safety equipment, <clears throat> the minimum required by law that were installed by Brightline for its privately owned business. Martin County has been more than accommodating to Brightline by selling the Martin County residents with its financial burden of paying approximately 60 million plus the dedication of a county-owned land to the Stewart Brightline business for the Stewart train station. Now the county wants to spend untold millions of dollars building three Abatross urban-style pedestrian bridges over the Brightline rail system and Dixie Highway as its solution to the death trains frequently railroad strikes. <clears throat> Unlike Brevard and Miami Con, Brightline is footing the bill and installing its own much needed safety equipment. Here in Martin County, where for some reason we have millions of dollars to throw at Brightline, the taxpayers are being called upon again to foot the bill for Brightline. Brightline has yet to step up to the plate and take responsibility for the lack of adequate safety equipment in Martin County, St. Lucie County, and all other counties in which it operates its high speed privately owned train station. It's time that uh, Martin County stands up for its residents and demands that Brightline start being responsible to pay for its own safety equipment. Equipment already known to Brightline and utilized by other high-speed railroad systems in the U.S., but which Brightline choose not to install. It's time for Brightline to install the same 
railway fencing along the tracks in Martin County that they are installing in other areas in Florida. Ma'am, your time is up. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Circus is going to be followed by Amy Pritchett. Good morning, Michael Circus. I'm a resident in Palm City. Uh, there's no doubt about it, Martin County residents are among some of the highest tax in the state of Florida. And later on today, we're going to discuss adding another half cent sales tax into our county coffers. Uh, there just never seems to be enough money for Martin County. And I believe I know the reason why. It's because we fail to prioritize. We really do struggle with this. And I'm going to give you an example of it. Last September, we endured just countless hours of arguments over how we're going to divvy up funds. And we ended up cutting out of our fixed asset review boards more than a half hour talk about how we're going to stop putting money into a savings account, fix constitutional offices. And immediately in the next meeting, we pillage our general reserves for $4 million to buy up development rights inside of CRA. You take a look at our capital improvement plan. We have four fire stations that need to be built out and replaced, 100% unfunded for $22.5 million. These are known services that we have to do. But yet, three months after we approved the budget, we found $45 million for a train station. I never thought I'd have to ask the question because I thought I knew the answer. Which one's more important, fire stations or train stations? Because we're not funding our fire stations, but we got money to build a train station. Now, I'll tell you what. I don't want to be right about this. I do believe that I'm right. We can't prioritize. But I want to challenge you today to prove me wrong because I want to be wrong. I don't want to be right. I want my county to stop mortgaging my kids' future and everybody's kids' future because we're spending money we don't have on objects we don't need and ignoring saving money for stuff we do need. In about 90 days, you guys are going to produce your fiscal year 25 budget. You're going to start discussing that. So prove me wrong. Show me you can live within your means. Show me that you don't consistently have to go back to the Martin County tax cow and start milking us for money. We don't have it, guys. 10% of your community is legally poverty stricken. 40% do not make the minimum wage to be in our community, the livable wage. Stop taxing us on all this stuff. You got to prioritize your funds. This is all in your control, but you need to do it, not us. Thank you. Amy Pritchett is followed by blank, blank more, blank. Elaine. Elaine Moore, okay. Good morning, commissioners. I would like to take a moment to thank um, veteran Hannons for his wonderful service. It was really touching, and I think we all are here because of the freedoms he provided for us. So thank you. I'm here today as a representative of Save Our Salerno. Uh, I shouldn't have to be here asking to save our Salerno. Um, I've been here for eight years and I've never seen a more determined, dedicated, or hardworking group of individuals as the people in Salerno who just want a voice. Uh, I went to an open house several weeks ago where we thought we would be able to give public input into projects that are going on in, in Port Salerno. Instead, and it was very nice, I'm not putting anybody down about this, but we were asked to provide input to the color of the building and, and the little accessorizing that would go on in this park of the mooring field, where all we are asking for is to be able to be able to see the view of the water. Don't take that away from us. Please don't take the view of the water away from our community. That's what we want. The color of the building doesn't matter. The pretty little accessories don't matter. What matters is the life that we're choosing to live, living on the water and being able to view it. So I hope, I hope that you'll listen to the voices in Save Our Salerno and, and give us what we're asking for, to just be able to live the beautiful and paradise life that we live in Martin County and the waters that make our community so attractive. Why would you take that view away? Thank you. Elaine Moore, followed by Jim Moyer. Good morning. I would just like to say that I agree with everything that Amy has to say. We in Salerno are going to no longer be quiet. We're tired of being spoon-fed stuff we don't want. We want representation for the local people, and we're tired of the way things are happening. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, Mr. Moyer, is followed by Ellen As Aslan. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for being here. Thank you for representing our community. I'm here as the Indian Riverkeeper today. I'm also a resident of Martin County and Rocky Point. Um, I'm here supporting Martin County Forever. It's a really important idea that its time is now. We've done this before. We know how to do it, but we need to limit ourselves. We need to follow the recommendations of the committees that have come before you with a very sensible plan. Going beyond those is probably going to doom it. It's important for you to follow the instructions given to you by the committee that has thought deeply about this and have spoken to you all about doing the right thing. This is going to be probably one of our last uh, abilities to get the land that we need to get for the future of Martin County and for the future of Florida. This is not going to be recreational amenities disguised as open space and, and, and called conservation. This is going to be for real conservation and it has to be for real conservation because we're losing that battle. We need to protect the wild places in Florida for ourselves and for, the f for our children, but also for the, f for the benefit of the wild places. They provide natural services that we cannot afford to provide for ourselves and we need to protect those and we need to do that by investing in our future and by putting that tax capital toward our future and investing in what makes Florida special and important for us and makes it possible for us to survive. The time is changing and we are going to have many, many more impacts than we could imagine right now. If we don't preserve that boundary, if we don't preserve that space between the wild and us, we're going to lose it forever. And we need to spend the capital, we need to do it soon, and we need to do it without further restrictions that will only make it harder to pass as a resolution on the, on the ballot and also uh, to make it harder for us to control that, that development that is probably inevitably going to pressure us in the future. I, I thank you for your consideration. I appreciate your vote. I appreciate what you do for our community. But please leave it alone. Let it pass forward and let the voters decide. Thank you very much. Okay, Ellen, which will pronounce her last name properly when she gets here, is followed, huh? Ellen Asselin. Okay, it wasn't that hard. It's followed by Linda Albright. Good morning, thank you. I'm a member of the NAC in Salerno, and I've written letters to you before, and I'm here to speak again about the Manatee Park where you plan to build a large facility for the mooring field. We would like to save this park because we have used for years. It's a beautiful view in a natural setting that you do not find anywhere else in the pocket. I have said before how many artists come from all over the country to paint and photograph the views that are enjoyed here. They come often. The benches and Picnic tables are used often by residents and visitors. Here you can watch not only boats, birds, dolphins, and even wildlife. Many of the boats that are anchored in the pocket now are located near Sanskrit Park. Very few are located near your dinghy dock. I do not understand why that location was not chosen for the facility you're wanting to build. We were given notice of the open house of the mooring field at the Civic Center in Port Salerno. That invitation at the bottom stated, questions? We were never given a chance to speak at this event, rather to pick a color on the facility on poster boards set up in the easels. Some had come prepared to speak. You can imagine the disappointment that came that evening. Ever since we were told there was to be a mooring field, we never got answers to the questions that went on for years. We were told by staff, <laughs> this is not an NAC CRA 
project. I feel we were never given that chance to even voice our opinions when you planned to take away our park. I feel you were more concerned about getting a grant than our residents. Thank you for allowing me to be heard today. Linda Albright is followed by Casey Kniff. Or Niff. Niffin. Good morning. Niffin. Niffin. Well, I'm talking to you because I live right next to where the Voyage Recovery Treatment House is. I've been there since 1989. I gr my kids grew up there. It's a very private road, but publicly maintained. I'm sorry. It's a public road, privately maintained. People walk their dogs there. I have an 89-year-old lady that walks every day there. It's a very quiet and peaceful road. At the home, I do notice, because I'm right there, that they are parking their vehicles in the back of the house. Why? I don't know. Martin County will have to figure that one out. The people currently there at the treatment home, they play basketball at night. They play pickleball at night, which is fine. There's only about four there. But I'm there around 10 o'clock with my dogs. I still hear them. But my question is, and my major concern is, what happens when there's more patients? Because they're going for reasonable accommodation, asking for more people. What's going to happen to my peaceful neighborhood when that happens? So my question is, why should a company come in, purchase a $4 million home that they think they can just move in, change my life, and the peaceful setting that I've lived there since 1989? I believe it's only about making money. I just want to thank you for letting me speak. KC, and she's going to pronounce her last name correctly. Was followed by, I can barely read it, um, something Mitchell. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Casey Darling Niffin, and I am the Conservation Policy Director with Florida Wildlife Federation. I'm also a Martin County voter and a river mom. Um, you'll remember last time we had a, a whole group of kids with us to um, be here in support of Martin County Forever. This is really for their future. Um, so I want to thank this board for previously approving Martin County Forever, the land conservation program um, that we are trying to move forward in Martin County for allowing it to be on the November ballot. Um, I am confident that our conservation-minded community will uh, vote in favor of that conservation program. Um, and I'm confident in that because of the effort that the Martin County Forever team has put into the ordinance um, and the resolution language. They've brought diverse stakeholders to the table. They have crafted this language so that people can feel assured that this um, taxpayer money will actually go to conservation. Um, and that is really important. It's important for me as a voter. It's important for organizations like mine that support uh, referendums for land conservation. Um, so what I'm asking you today is to um, remember the energy in the room, to keep that ordinance language and the resolution language the way it is, to um, remember all of the young people that were here. And um, I want to leave you with a quote from a student and a river kid from last meeting, um, Sophia Keith, who's 10 years old. She was quoted in the TC Palm uh, in the gallery, and she said, um, I think this really sums up the essence of land conservation, true land conservation. She said, um, I'm a giant animal lover, and we can't live on this earth without plants. You know, it's as simple as that. The kids understand it. Um, we need true conservation in Martin County. As Jim Moyer said, our time is running out. So please um, leave the ordinance language and the resolution language as is. Allow Martin County to pass this in November and let's secure our future for ourselves and our, and our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Amelia Mitchell. Huh? 
Oh, okay. Uh, Mark Ternessa. You might want to pronounce that correctly when you get here. Followed by Mr. Tom Pine. Ternessa. You oh, good. got it right. Good morning. My name is Mark Ternessa. I'm a single father with a four-year-old daughter, and I've lived in the Moorings community for 14 years. I am the last house on Loxahatchee River Road, just before the last left turn, to access the sober home located at 18890 Southeast Jupiter Road. This is a dead-end street which makes all traffic to and from this sober residence pass right by my home. This facility that is already up and running is just seven houses down from the double homicide that shook our community a few years ago. This double murder was committed by a young man suffering from drug, drug and alcohol addiction. This trauma has affected our community more than you can imagine. Just think about these victims, John Stevens, and Michelle Mishkan, who were in their garage one evening and were randomly attacked and stabbed to death at the hands of a man suffering from addiction. The mere fact that this facility is allowed to operate in such close proximity to a community already scarred, suffering, and trying to recover from recent horrific trauma goes against the values and principles of our town. Even worse, we were not even allowed to voice our opinions or objections even though we are the residents most affected by your judgment. I am not even here to request that this facility be shut down, as I am aware they have rights to operate where they desire. I am here to ask that you please deny their request for a reasonable accommodation to allow even more patients to recover in this home. For the past few weeks, our community has witnessed the black Mercedes Sprinter van running patients to and from their other facilities located in the area. As if this isn't bad enough, as a constant reminder of the new sober home planted in the middle of what used to be a quaint neighborhood, they are also requesting the right to have even more patients located at this residence. Let me make something abundantly clear. Upholding zoning and safety codes does not in any way deprive disabled residents of their rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act. In fact, it is quite the opposite. By ensuring compliance with these regulations, we are not only safeguarding the well-being of all residents, but also upholding the principles of fairness and equality that the ADA stands for. The last point I'd like to make is that the ADA is not a free pass to circumvent zoning and safety codes. While it does require reasonable accommodations to be made for individuals with disabilities, these accommodations must still be consistent with applicable laws and regulations. By maintaining this balance, we can ensure that the rights of all residents are respected while also upholding the integrity of our community. Thank you for your time. You. Mr. Pine will be followed by Craig, what appears to be Coy. Maybe. Craig. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name's Tom Pine. I've been a resident of Martin County for over 50 years now. Today is Stamp Out Hunger Day in Martin County. Did this happen by chance or was it planned? Because today is also the day this county commission commissioners are going to adopt an ordinance to add a half cent sales tax to the November general election for the purpose of buying conservation lands. I recently attended a meeting with the Hutchinson Island Preservation Initiative where two men from Martin County forever spoke about raising the sales tax by half a percent to purchase conservation land. At the conclusion, I spoke with one of the men. He couldn't see the rele relevance between raising the sales tax and food insecurity. I had to leave. That's what happens when people doing good things only look at the problem from their side. Obviously, he's never had to go to bed hungry, or anyone is for his, in his family for that matter, but many Martin County residents do go to bed hungry every single night. Sales tax is a regressive tax and disproportionately affects lower income households. With that understanding, if you have the money and you support the issue, you should participate by supporting private donations and you should also understand why there is opposition to this tax. Over the past several years, at least one county commission stated we cannot use tax dollars to build affordable housing because taxpayers would revolt but it was okay to build the most expensive county-owned golf club at the county golf course in the entire state of Florida. 
it was okay now that that was okay. Now the new fire training facility is starting to open. Will this also be the most expensive fire training facility in the state of Florida too? This past Saturday, I went to a meet and greet in Palm City for Mr. Michael Sykes. Unfortunately, I had the wrong address and went to the Martin County Community Center. I answered the door, didn't recognize anybody and left. Went out front and verified the address. It was right. The, ad the address was right, I returned. The lady I believe that was in charge stated loud in, in a loud voice, get out, you don't belong here. Twice. I hesitated, turned around and walked out. This is what a bully looks like. Who did we, our government, rent the community center to on April 6, 2024, around 1.30 in the afternoon? A bully that was. What you promote, what you permit, you promote. What you allow, you encourage. What you condone, you own. Thank you for your time. Craig Coy, maybe? Followed by Ann. Good morning. Thank you for my time. I, uh, I had my granddaughter here, but she got a little nervous, so she's uh, decided not to speak. But uh, uh, she's lived here, and she's president of her uh, environmental club in her school, so she wanted to be here. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Martin County Forever group and worked with uh, many of you and, and the staff and talking to many people about this, and I just want to thank you all for the work that you've done. I would remind the, uh, the last speaker that the uh, sales tax is not uh, on groceries, uh, prescriptions, and school supplies, so I don't think it would have any impact on, on food other than the inflation that we're all seeing uh, otherwise. So that's what the sales tax uh, would avoid. Uh, this, this agenda item would uh, <coughs> not have anything to do with the sales tax. But I do thank you for your support. Uh, we live here, we, we like it here, and the staff and the team have been terrific. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Ann Rolan, Rolan. I think I got it, thank you. Followed by Catherine Lawler. She wanna use the record with Mike? Sure. <coughs> Hi, my name is Ann Rolene. I am now a resident of Florida. I spent uh, 40 years as a consultant volunteer in the state of Illinois sitting on your side of the desk much of the time. I represented the community for the mayor and for the governor for over 40 years, much to do with alcohol, teen drug abuse, teen girls empowerment, and physical and emotional disabilities, including mental health. So therefore, I have been on both sides. I see that there's issues. I understand your job is to try and find a balance. In looking at a balance, I ask you to find what is best for both sides. And as part of that lower part that was bringing, brings everybody up from the bottom, I hope you will see that some of us who now are ADA sensitive in my old age and in retirement also have a fear of living where I live now if there's too many people under some of those difficult circumstances. It is true that they need a great deal of extra thought and care, but as do the residents, because now I can be afraid of living where I live. I am one-third of a mile, very walkable for most people, and I live in an area where it is gated, but it is not fenced. There is a small gate that takes a code, many of whom have the code, and when they come in to our neighborhood or they walk through the yards to our neighborhood, or they walk in from the park to our neighborhood. We have to be able to see that we are all safe, and it is hard for me to go to the yard. It is hard for me to become the kind of citizen I was when I consulted with these, all these certain people that have certain special needs. I, too, have a special need. I know you as commissioners need to balance this. All I ask is you think of both sides and you think that this side of the neighborhood where we pay taxes, where we've bought, where we've moved, all have the same kind of rights, and I don't believe that the rights of the business to come in and expand, because that is a greater profit, should be out of balance with what we have, as all of you find as we are on the same team. So I'm on your team, I hope you're on our team, and I ask you to deny this request.
My last speaker form is uh, Christine Lawler. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Catherine Lawler, oh. um, and I am strongly against granting any zoning variances to the Voyage Recovery Center uh, or the property located at 11800 Southeast Jupiter Road. I spoke at the last meeting about my concern for my safety and my handicapped sister. After reviewing the request for accommodation and the Voyage Recovery website, I believe that the business plan for the for-profit corporation that purchased the single-family home always included 10 to 14 residences. They knew they needed appropriate accommodations for these young men. They could have and should have chosen a more appropriate property, a multi-unit building, such as an apartment building, hotel, motel, or strip mall, that they could have converted and operated their business. In fact, there is uh, a business on US-1 in Palm Beach County, old strip mall they converted, and it's working out beautifully. Yet they chose a single-family home and a single-family home community where not one multi-unit structure exists. It's really problematic to me that a for-profit corporation can purchase a single-family home strictly for business purposes, then claim they deserve a reasonable accommodation under ADA laws for a zoning variation to allow 10 to 14 unrelated young men to live in a single-family home in a single-family community. What's worse, local residents, local government leaders, mayors, department chairs, and county commissioners seem to have no ability to do what is right in their community. This needs to change. In this case, the person applying for the zoning variance is a for-profit business and is not, to my knowledge, handicapped. Current zoning laws allow four unrelated people to live in a single family home. I do not believe this law should be changed to accommodate any for-profit business and I urge the request for accommodation be denied. This is not the only house they could have purchased. There are a lot more suitable properties around for purchase that would have better suited their business plan. The fact is that the business purpose needs the zoning accommodation, not the owner. They need the zoning change to make their bad choice of properties fit their business plan and to increase revenues and profits. Think about the huge difference in revenue and profits between four residents and 15 residents. Granting the, zoning, granting the request and changing the zoning laws would be discriminatory to the individuals leg, living legally in the surrounding single family uh, homes in the community. I do not believe the ADA laws were constructed to protect a profit motive or improve a bad business choice. Let's be the first case to prove this and deny that request. Thank you so much. Thank you. And do we have any other? I have no more speaker forms. Um, seeing nobody else, we'll go to the commissioners. Commissioner Smith. Um, Ms. Woods, on this last speaker and the speakers relative to the um, to the home, or I guess go over here. Elise, do you want to? Commissioner Smith, and I'll defer to Elise Elder, my deputy county attorney. Can we again lay out the process for the public? We have a lot of folks in here who have heard this now a couple times, but for those that have not uh, been present in the audience to understand what what is the process that is going to happen and what to what extent do we have say or no say? And then if you can get through that for us, then I'll have a few more comments after that. Of course. Elise Elder, Deputy County Attorney. So in accordance with the uh, Fair Housing Act and the American Disabilities Act, the county has an ordinance that enables a citizen or a resident of Martin County to ask for a reasonable accommodation from our zoning comprehensive plan or our land development regulations. Any Anybody in Martin County can utilize that um, reasonable accommodation ordinance. The county has no control over it. So what happens is somebody submits an application to have a reasonable accommodation from some co one of our regulations. County staff will evaluate that application to make sure the information is complete. Um, if the information is not complete, they will ask the applicant for additional information, which is what happened in Voyager. So 
county staff felt like additional information was needed to evaluate the application. So they've asked for additional information, which I believe we received. So also county staff will speak to the different departments within the county to see what the impact is of the accommodation. So for example, they'll send it to public works to see what the impact is on the roads. They'll send it to the fire prevention division to see what the impact is from the fire prevention perspective. Once the county gathers all the relevant information, um, they'll schedule it for a reasonable accommodation hearing. That's kind of the stage where we are right now. This hearing goes before an independent hearing officer. So the county um, contracts out with a local attorney who has experience in this area of the law to be the presiding officer over the hearing. The Board of County Commissioners has absolutely no participation in this type of hearing. They have no control over the outcome. So it's up to the applicant during the hearing to prove to the hearing officer that they are entitled to a reasonable accommodation under the law. So the burden is on them. It will be a, a quasi-judicial hearing where they will present evidence. The hearing officer evaluates the evidence presented and then makes a ruling. Staff doesn't recommend one way or the other whether or not the reasonable accommodation should be granted. The board doesn't recommend. It's basically staff gathers all the information for the hearing officer to make the decision and then the applicant has the burden to prove whether or not they're entitled to the reasonable accommodation at that hearing and then the hearing officer renders the written opinion most likely after the hearing and that's kind of how the process works. So another couple other questions. Um, are there interveners allowed? There are no interveners in the reasonable accommodation process. No, it's quasi-judicial. Yes, there's only certain circumstances that we allow interveners, and that's when someone has to receive notice pursuant to Article 10. The reasonable accommodation, there's no interveners because it's it has to do with American Disabilities Act and disabilities, so it would be prejudicial to a um, an applicant. Does the public have the right to attend the hearing and uh, voice their concerns, opinions? So it's a public hearing. The public has the right to attend the hearing. There is no public comment during that hearing, um, but they can provide their comment um, via email um, to the county, and the county provides all public comment to the hearing officer at the time of the hearing. So if anybody's provided public comment, that email will be provided to the hearing officer to consider. And so who here in staff should that be funneled to you? It can come to me or um, Daphne Schwab, who is um, from our growth management department, is actually the planner in charge. I don't have her email address, but I can provide you mine, and I could forward any emails to her. It is e-e-l-d-e-r at martin.fl.us. So if you send me an email, I'll forward it on to Daphne to make sure the uh, hearing officer receives it. And would it be advisable for the neighborhood to, <clears throat> in writing, communicate to their federal uh, delegation and their state delegation and copy all of those responses from them to you to be part of the hearing? Uh, yes, you could do that as well. I'm just sort of trying to seed you with what you can do, I guess. Um, if in this case the hearing officer finds in agreement with the applicant, what happens next? So usually they will issue an order um, that allows them to have that accommodation. And what are the rights of our residents post that decision? Uh, they don't have many rights available to them. Um, Is there a legal avenue that they can file an <laughs> objection in some form, shape, or fashion to some court? Um, they can file an objection with our county administrator. Um, so, And there is a process for the county administrator to evaluate it. And if that is like the other processes that go to our county administrator, the administrator will rule on the information? In this situation, the administrator has the ability to overturn the um, hearing officer. Um, and if that happens, then the hearing officer, I mean, then the applicant will be able to file a, um, an action in, in circuit court or county court. And if that happens, I'm just trying to walk through every yep. little detail so everybody kind of knows where we are. What happens then? So if it is 
approved by the hearing officer and overturned by the county administrator and we go to court, then we will defend the county in um, the court. Nothing will happen probably until after the court proceeding is over um, unless they get some kind of injunction requiring us to you know, issue the accommodation. And I'm not trying to seed this with any real negative thoughts other than I believe Del Rey went through this in a major way and lost at a major way. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in the millions and millions of dollars from what I recall. Yes. Um, I think though that um, for our residents to exhaust every avenue, uh, you may want to consider what Elise has just shared with you. Um, and that if, <clears throat> if we need to exercise every right that we have as a board, um, then we will do so, or at least I will. Um, but I will, I'm, I'm trying to share with you the idea that <clears throat> this has been fought many times before uh, and has not gone very far. Uh, the other th the suggestion I, I, I'm thinking about and have thought about in the prior times you all have spoke, um, in all of your research that you have done about recovery, or voyage, I'm sorry, um, has there been any ex uh, uh, discovery of who owns and actually who is involved in it? Sure. Yes. Okay. I mean, I mean, we can't talk back and forth, but I'm, I would, I would encourage you all in your research efforts to dig as deep as you can dig, um, and make that known uh, to anybody that's willing to listen, uh, because you might find somewhere deep down in all of this there are people in Martin County that are invested in all this. And that may not be a happy storyline for someone to be part of as a recommendation or a thought. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm done. Okay. All right. Commissioner okay. Hetherington. First, I want to uh, congratulate Honor Flight on their 50th flight on Saturday. Um, yep, Honor Flight is a Elise. Absolutely. Southeast Honor Flight is a fabulous organization that accompanies veterans to Washington, D.C. I know that several of us have done it, and some of us multiple times. It's a fabulous organization. Their next flight is in May. I also wanted to update you on some things that we have in my district. I mentioned these yesterday at the uh, transportation planning meeting, but for those members of the board that were not here, we had a meeting in my district at South River, South River is a neighborhood on Canner Highway with about 540 some odd members. Uh, they are prioritized on the transportation planning priorities, probably at number four on the priority list for um, some major sa uh, traffic safety enhancements, which include a traffic light, a right-hand turn lane. They have, since Canner has been widened, the, the residents have a very unsafe condition getting in and out of the neighborhood. So we've been addressing this for several years. The meeting that we held just two weeks ago, there were about 250 people in attendance. Um, I thank DOT for attending the meeting and presenting what we have um, as a right-hand turn lane into the neighborhood. If anybody's driven down Canner Highway recently, you've seen the quite unappealing delineators in that area. Those are very temporary in nature. The purpose was to make sure that the turning movements in and out of South River made it a safer environment. We restricted the um, left-hand turning movement out of the neighborhood to a right-hand turn only. So those delineators were to test that moving and um, we are very happy, the residents of South River are very happy with the way it's working. So we're proceeding to put those uh, <coughs> permanent delineators, which will be so much more aesthetically pleasing, I promise. Uh, the residents will be voting on the right-hand turn lane. Some of them were concerned about the sight distance, um, having that right turn only around the curve. So DOT um, did as much um, educating and presenting as they possibly could for that. And that neighborhood is still um, prioritized for a traffic light and it's much needed if you've driven in and out of there. So I'm gonna continue to advocate that we keep that on the MPO priority list for that neighborhood. And then the 
final thing I mentioned at yesterday's transportation meeting is we've been waiting for quite some time for some speed feedback signs. And when I say quite sometimes, about a year that we've been waiting for DOT to get these in and there's been some supply chain issues with the posts. So I'm hoping that DOT can help us expedite that because just having the awareness of the speed you're going has helped in other parts of the district and the residents are very eager to get those speed feedback um, signs in as well as the sheriff's department. I will thank them for their enhanced enforcement in that area. And that is the update for South River. And that's all I have. Good morning. I apologize for being uh, late. I had the opportunity to address Project Lift this morning, and I wanted to, uh, to thank them for their efforts. This issue with the sober home is, in my years of sitting up here, one of the most frustrating and challenging that, that we've had to consider. Commissioner Smith, I thought you did a good job of you know, laying out how terribly restricted we are in our decision making. First, I think that bears repeating is the fact that if it were up to the five of us, you would have come here the first time and that's all you would have needed to do. It would not have happened. I think the residents have been thoughtful and reasonable and they've done research and they've come here and they were always very careful to not criticize people that are having uh, addiction issues and they've also said you know we don't want this in our neighborhood it's already there and they are reasonable in their thought process to say we understand that there's four people that can stay here but I agree with what I've heard this morning that you don't buy a four million dollar home to turn it into a sober home when you expect to only have four residents then when you layer on top of that that this street, that could have been any one of our streets, but this particular street has a catastrophic incident that took place where two of their neighbors were not only murdered, they were mutilated, and the story made nationwide news and is as horrific as it could possibly be. And let's not also forget one of their hero neighbors that went to the aid of these folks was also severely injured. Then can you imagine several years later that someone decides they're going to put a home of people that are struggling with some of the same addictions and issues that the person, the murderer, did. It's, it goes beyond reason. So my thinking to our staff, and I wanted Ms. Elder to stay, is because this whole thing makes no sense. It's a public hearing, but the residents are not allowed to speak. They can't intervene. You know, as Commissioner Smith said of our staff, it's that we don't even really have a, a, a policy to, to object after the fact. Now, I am hoping and praying that the, the hearing officer, the magistrate, whatever his title is, her title, <clears throat> sees it the same way that we do. Because they're coming forward asking for a reasonable accommodation. I think everyone, except for maybe them, would agree it's not reasonable. It's not a reasonable accommodation because they made a poor business decision. That cost of that business decision should not be paid for by the residents. They were there first. There is places, you know, we all agree that addiction is terrible. And, you know, that it probably falls within the ADA guidelines. But I don't see how that could just mean that the residents just have to shut their mouths and just deal with whatever comes their way because it is, it is an abomination. So if, as a commissioner, I'm not sure I'm allowed to write letters uh, to participate, but as a citizen, I can. Uh, and I don't know if my colleagues are interested, and I'm assuming that if you flood, um, do we have any idea who the magistrate will be? Um, we have not uh, scheduled it yet. Usually our magistrate is Keith Davis, but we don't know if he's going to do this particular hearing. We haven't contacted him. We just got the complete, the additional information, so we're now in the process of trying to schedule the hearing. So we haven't <clears throat> figured it out yet, but it will happen very shortly. Okay. Um, I don't know who that is. I know the other person better. Um, 
do you, in your professional legal opinion, think that hmm. she's a lawyer? <laughs> I'm asking her prof if you think you shouldn't answer this question. Do you feel that the more um, feedback, letters, flooding with uh, emails and hearing from different individuals is a useful exercise or is it a uh, waste of time? So if there's information that might impact um, the hearing officer's decision making, like evidence that would be for or against the reasonable accommodation, I think that would be helpful. If people are just saying, I don't want it, I don't know that that's a factor that um, is going to be evaluated. It has to be public health, safety, welfare. Co those kind of issues would be helpful, I would say. Good to know. And finally, um, a couple of meetings ago, there was a, a statistic mentioned that you're not allowed by state statute, and I'd like uh, our legal team to review, that you can't have a sober home within a certain uh, distance of an additional, of another sober home. And these smart residents have done research to say that it looks like there is a couple of examples of that. I, on behalf of myself exclusively, would ask our legal staff and our growth management staff to look at every single detail and that nothing is left um, to the chance uh, or the decision making of the magistrate. This is, I, I don't think this is a... Um, <laughs> us or them issue. There's plenty of other up places that these homes could be built. This one is already there with four people. To add one single additional person creates another layer of potential uh, peril for the residents. I think it's, as I said in the past, I think it's absolutely terrible. Thank you. Mr. Hurd. Yeah. Um, ch chapter four of the comprehensive plan requires that a residential capacity analysis must be updated every five years. And I think that the last uh, residential capacity analysis that was conducted was in 2015. So one is overdue. Um, according to uh, chapter four, when undeveloped acreage in the primary urban service boundary or the secondary urban service boundary no longer provides capacity for the 15 year planning, planned population, planning for expansion of residential capacity must commence. Uh, when the uh, primary urban service boundary and the secondary ur urban service boundary uh, provides deficient capacity for 10 years, the county must expand capacity. Um, so this residential capacity shall be recalculated every five years. We are at least uh, nine years behind in this critical planning tool. Um, this residential capacity analysis provides uh, predictable, reliable, accountable uh, expansion and it's a legal requirement, and if we don't do this, then developers determine where future growth is going to occur in Marion County. So it's absolutely essential if we want to control our future growth, which we do, we put it in the right place um, <coughs> and in the right way that we need to have the residential capacity analysis as soon as possible. Thank you. I completely agree with that. Um, I actually drove past this home a couple weeks ago and was just amazed at how it's absolutely beautiful home in an absolutely gorgeous neighborhood. Um, why my business mind is just trying to figure out why, how that makes sense. But anyway, I, I hear what you're saying. It's in my district. Um, my two colleagues have done a wonderful job as usual um, stating, I think what our position is uh, up here, which I'm in full support. I have um, a request to the board to uh, authorize me to sign a letter. Uh, the village of Tequesta is requesting a support letter to uh, Governor DeSantis for improvements of Tequesta Park. Tequesta Park is a very odd thing. It is in Martin County, and it is owned by the state of Florida. So, um, and this letter is to, uh, for improvements to be funded by the state, uh, which would include baseball and softball field improvements, multi 
all-purpose fields, basketball courts, and a dog park, and some nature walks. Uh, we wrote a letter to um, um, uh, Representative Snyder. Um, the request was partially funded, so this letter is uh, begging the governor not to to uh, veto that out of the budget, um, which I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot of other uh, issues um, that are similar to that. My Petway water potable water project is, is one that was also partially funded and is sitting on his desk and hoping that we don't get vetoed. So anyway, I just need um, uh, approval. Need to, um, do I need a motion or not? It's, it was part of your uh, um, legislative priorities to support that. So um, a head nod would be head sufficient. Nod yes. <laughs> yes. Take a motion. Take a motion to approve the chairman's signature on a letter to. Okay. Second. Yep. All right. Sure. We have a motion by Commissioner Smith, seconded by Commissioner Hetherington. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I've heard that the governor is in Martin County this morning, uh, uh -oh. right now, actually. So we could go see him. Cool. <coughs> I can't say. <laughs> nice. All right. Actually, I heard he's at the Walgreens on US 1. And I'm not kidding. That's what I heard he is. He's doing a press conference there. At Walgreens. That's what I heard. Okay. I would recommend that you all get in your car <coughs> and go to Walgreens. Yeah, no doubt. <coughs> you won't see him. All right. <coughs> I have a few items at the end of the day, so if you could pause before you end the meeting so oh, okay. we can conclude some business. All right, so what we want to try to do, I think, before the 1030 break is do, um, is do our um, sales tax uh, public hearing number one. We're going to do that after. Yeah. Donna, is that what you told me to do? Yes. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay. All right, so uh, public hearing to consider adoption of an ordinance calling for the referendum on a 10-year half-cent sales tax for uh, conservation lands. Um, Ms. Woods. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Sarah Woods, county attorney, for the record. Um, this agenda item brings forward a draft ordinance calling for a referendum on the question of whether to levy a 10-year, one-half-cent <coughs> local government infrastructure sales tax for the acquisition of conservation lands to be placed on the November 5th, 2024 general election ballot. Um, this was discussed most recently on um, February 20th of this year. We, county staff, in coordination with the conservation initiative Martin County Forever, has prepared an ordinance that calls for the referendum. The, maybe we should put the, Don, if you could put the ballot language up. There it is. Um, it will, the, the title of the ballot will be Lands to Protect Water Quality, Natural Areas, and Wildlife Habitat, one half percent sales tax. The question is, shall Martin County protect its water quality and unique character by acquiring critical natural lands in Martin County within the Indian River Lagoon South, Palmar, Loxahatchee and St. Lucie Headwaters and Blueways areas and provide municipal infrastructure allowed by law by levying a one-half uh, percent county sales tax for 10 years starting January 1st of 2025 with an annual audit and citizen oversight. Um, I'm not going to go line by line through every bit of the ordinance, but Section 6 is probably the most important of the ordinance. It limits how the county can, can um, use its share of the proceeds. They, uh, the county may use it to acquire by fee simple environmentally significant lands for the purposes of con preserving construction Irving and restoring the St. Lucie River, Indian River Lagoon, Palmar, and Loxahatchee St. Lucie River headwaters, um, thereby protecting the water sources, preserving natural areas and beaches. Um, land acquisition and preservation is limited to the properties that are known or identified in those areas that I had um, identified at the beginning of this agenda item, which is the Palmar Water Control District the natural lands component of the Indian River Lagoon South project of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, Loxahatchee and St. Lucie Headwaters and Blue 
Blue Ways areas in Martin County. It uh, Section B of this, subsection B of this ordinance allows the county to acquire perpetual interest in lands through conservation easements in such environmentally significant lands. So both by fee simple and by um, by conservation easements, both of those would be, and that's all the 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 uh, land the um, acquisition can be used for the proceeds. Um, uh, following the board's input at the February twentieth meeting, um, there was discussion about how to establish a citizens oversight committee who, under the ordinance, would review and make recommendations to the board about any lands to be acquired or conservation easements, um, because as well may be uh, the fact, it could take 20 or 30 years for us to um, expend all of these monies. It's important for the um, land oversight, citizens oversight committee to be described in my legal opinion um, and the county administrators in areas of expertise as opposed to a specific group. The specific groups can then be implemented by the ordinance uh, I mean the resolution. In this case, the uh, current language is that the EL ELOC, which is the Environmental Lands Oversight Committee, shall be composed of nine Martin County registered voters from each of the following categories. Four members shall be appointed from dedicated environmental organizations with missions fo focused on education, research, preservation, rest restoration, and protecting the public's local water quality, the natural environment, and to enhance and restore local e ecosystems. Three members shall be appointed with one member representing each of the following, an organization with a mission fo focused on fiscal oversight of government funding budgets and spending, an organization with mission focused on the real estate industry, and finally an organization with a mission focused on responsible business growth and economic development. One member shall be appointed from an organization with a mission focused on educating, promoting, and protecting the interests of agricultural farmers and ranchers. And finally, one member shall be appointed from an organization with a dedicated mission to preserve, protect, and secure natural lands in Martin County. Um, this, as I said before, this advisory committee would be established by a resolution of the board once um, and would come into existence assuming that this ordinance is approved, ratified on the ballot measure. Um, the draft resolution establishing the Environmental Oversight Committee will be submitted for uh, Board of County Commissioner consideration at a future board meeting if this ordinance is uh, approved today. Um, just a quick overview of the issues, the duration of the tax, the amount of the tax, uh, their section 61c places a limit of 5% of the purchase price of any acquired land to be used for exotic removal or restoration of conservation land. As an aside, this again reiterates that this, uh, the sales tax proceeds are going to be used for land acquisition and preservation and for really nothing else. A small portion is for, for uh, restoration of the acquired land. Um, I attached a memo containing the schedule for the November 5th election. Um, again, the ordinance, if approved, won't take effect unless it's approved by a majority of the voters at the November 5th election. Um, this ordinance will also be submitted to the, now I'm going to move the Florida. Um, <coughs> Lost. It's a it's a, a Florida uh, an, a Florida um, oversight committee with the state of Florida that will do a um, an analysis of the viability of. I'm, I apologize. I forgot the name of the organization, but that's under Florida law, and will that will come come back to Martin County and be publicly available on our website prior to the November fifth election. And with that. Um, 
My recommendation is move that the board approve the draft ordinance if the board would like to place the question of the sales tax on November 5th, 2024 consideration by Martin voters. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for staff? Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Um, Mr. Campy, go ahead. Just a reiteration of the fact that this is not the board raising a half a cent sales tax. This is the board agreeing to allow the citizens of Martin County to go through the summer for and against, let their voices be heard, whether they like this idea or they don't, and that they be given the opportunity to vote. And that's how I see it. I think the language that Ms. Woods and all of the interested parties that participated in wordsmithing this did an excellent job. It eliminates the concern that if you specifically identify a group that three or four or five years from now happens to no longer exist, it's a difficult process to remove that specific group. Um, so I am in complete favor of allowing our residents to make their own determination. Thank you. Commissioner Hetherington. One, I would, I would just reiterate the conservation easements would apply to things like uh, Florida, you know, rural lands, and so I'm, I'm just happy to see that language was in there because I think not only in Martin County, but if we're going to preserve land in Florida, as ag is one of our biggest industries, that we're going to have to figure out how to keep agricultural industries, farming and ranching, and things like conservation easements are things that can keep that that those operations viable. So um, I did have a question on your member board because I don't recall seeing this in the draft. There's four members from an environmental agency and on the bottom it says one member from an organization dedicated mission to preserve and protect uh, preserving lands. That sounds like the same thing to me. Well, I think the the four members are more looking at education and restoring, and the the difference would be the final the one member is someone that is an organization that's trying to acquire lands as opposed to advocating for the preservation of lands. It, 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 there's it's a different mission for some of our organizations. I'd like to see that one include because you the key is going to be finding willing sellers and most of this land other than the blue ways is going to be agriculturally um, owned land so the more agricultural interests if you could put another one at the table you have one include in that statement that there is um, somebody that is an owner can sit at the table you you need those willing sellers that would be in my opinion I because I think you're going to need as many willing sellers as you can get. I've heard a lot from a different amount of residents on this, both for and against it. Um, I, I agree to put it out to the voters for their determination, but I just didn't understand. It looked to me like that last appointee is the same as the first um, bullet point. I, I I think in discussions and Mr. Donaldson or maybe Martin Forever may want to uh, step up. I think the idea was an organization whose primary mission is acquisition, um, as opposed uh, acquiring the property, and that would be provide an additional almost a professional skill as the uh, as that was done. And the, the AG was intended for the representative of, of someone, of a entity that was interested in preserving AG farmers and ranchers. I, I don't think this is what you were saying, but a owner, someone who would conceivably want to put their property up for acquisition couldn't sit on the acquisition board. They'd have a conflict of interest. Well, I'm more interested in the industry itself. Uh, you yes. Know, if you want to preserve more land in Florida, it, not only Martin County, then you've got to keep that land being productive because if ranchers and farmers can't farm their land, then they're going to sell it off for development. 
So anything like a conservation easement, I just noticed it. I want a clarification because it seemed to me, I didn't understand it. It, You made your point, but it seemed to me that it fell in that block of the four, but I understand what you're saying. Yes, ma'am. So we do have somebody that seems to want to actually comment on your comment. So as part of the group. As part of the. Thank you very much, uh, Craig Coy again. Uh, I was part of the group that worked with the staff to try to, to do some of the drafting of this, <coughs> and uh, it was it was done in obviously good faith to uh, address the concerns, the legitimate and uh, proper concerns that uh, that were raised. And in all candor and all fairness, the uh, the group that you're talking about would be, if you will, a uh, uh, a non-advocate group in the sense of for a specific. Uh, area of interest, whether it be development, real estate, business, uh, preservation. And it was candidly uh, a group similar to uh, Martin County Forever of trying to be a, you know, a, a non-advocate group for a specific area, but try to find a common ground and, and to be the, uh, the uh, safekeeper of the, uh, of the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Smith. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't what I was going to comment on, but now that Stacy has raised it, I, I in, in many ways, I, I agree with her thought process. Um, I raised this last time when ag wasn't even in the discussion. Ag was left completely off of the discussion list. And if the largest chunks of land that we want to acquire are ag <clears throat> or we want to have easements on, the more representation to get us to where we want to get to, I think, is imperative. I, I don't, <coughs> excuse me. I'm just thinking about when this board sits and, and talks and, 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 is, and, and they're going to vote amongst themselves to send us a recommendation. <coughs> you have a, and rightfully so, you have a very heavy weighted environmental Are we gonna do? I don't know what we're gonna do here. Yeah. We're, we're, we're Let Commissioner I'm Smith listening. finish his um, thoughts. Rightfully so, we have a very heavy weighted environmental focus on this committee. Um, I, in many ways, I would think that you would want your largest land collective group to be part of this discussion as, as well to be advocates for exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I, th I think that you could blend, <coughs> excuse me, the language of one into your four and get what you want by having an advocate if there is such a thing for an organization that wants to maintain the integrity of what this was all about in the first place. Um, there always seems to be this undercurrent of, of concern that somehow we are not, we, the county or, or your local government is not going to do what was written in the first place. And I, that stresses me a lot because I've been involved in probably the last three of these measures. And to the extent that I have worked on them, I have supported them, I have funded them, we have accomplished exactly what was set out to be done in the first place. And so the fear, the underlying concern, the marketing tool of saying, well, the purpose of this is to make sure that it happens the way we wanted it to be, I, I will tell you, I have spent a lot of my private money in the past supporting these measures, and they have passed the ones that I could get behind and support, and they did exactly what we asked them to do. And this is tagging on to thousands and thousands of acres that we have acquired as part of former tax referendums. And so I don't, sh I don't share the concern that however the makeup of this committee is formed, um, that it is somehow there to, to protect <coughs> the integrity of the ordinance itself. It is a legal binding document that there have been times in the past where there was money sitting there that we considered going back to the voters and asking them to reassign the funding from that former referendum because it couldn't be spent enough on what we wanted it to be spent. We didn't do it, and it took, as Sarah said, it's taken 20 years to spend all that money. Um, anyway, I, I, I don't disagree with, with, with uh, Commissioner Hetherington. I, 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 I would be more 
happy to see uh, an additional ag representative of some sort. And then there's the other issue, and I have no doubt that the speakers that got up and spoke this morning, they, although they weren't looking directly at me, um, it was certainly my comments to, uh, to one of the representatives about something I wished I had brought up uh, in the conversation in our last hearing relative to an additional category of land acquisition. And that goes directly to the idea that we would have funding, the availability of funding to go to acquisition of land or anything, land if, is the only way to say it, next to existing parks. Um, I, I think of how many times we would love to have been able to acquire additional parkland. And I know that the idea behind this is conservation and that no one will ever step foot on a piece of this property someday. But I think about additionally how important it is, and some of the speakers spoke this morning, to our kids and their future. And for those who spoke to your kids in your future, our parks, I think, are as, as in as important and as integral to our community as any other piece of this is to our community. Um, the representative I spoke to, I said, look, if there aren't three votes from the board to add this component to it, fine, I'll walk away from it. You can all go do your thing, and, and I hope to God it passes for you. Um, but at the same time, I just think, and I, and I can give you a perfect example. We, we, over in Rio, we have uh, Langford Park. And there's two commercial properties out, and, and Langford is pretty much hemmed, it, it, not pretty much, Langford Park is hemmed in. It is completely surrounded by residential and or commercial. Fifteen years ago, uh, a parcel came available. We had some money available in our parks um, funding, and we acquired it, and we put a skate park in. And it's a fantastic asset, and it's a wonderful piece of our park. There are two commercial properties that if they were ever to become available next to that park, if we were to acquire them, would really substantially change and alter the character and the ability for Langford to be something even better. Um, I would love to see that kind of language be added to the Blue Ways, the, 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 the Palmar property language and so on. But again, I, I am not gonna die on the sword of this. I know specifically, because it was said very specifically by three speakers that got up, do not mess with the language. We love it the way it is. It'll fail if you don't. I don't believe it'll fail. As a matter of fact, I believe that if moms and dads and kids believe that their parks could be expanded someday by the acquisition, you might get more voters to come out and actually support it. There are not going to be the same people People that would come out and support that language or that component of it are not going to vote against it because it's conservation land. They will vote for it because it adds to our park system, which we have an incredibly stout super system. Um, I just think it's important. And, and if it doesn't have support of the board, fine. Go off and do your thing and, and have a nice day. I mean, I, and I don't mean to be that way, but it's just, I should have brought this up and I didn't think about it until a week after and I thought, you know, here's an opportunity to do something special, but if it's not supported, it's not supported and so be it. Thank you. Commissioner Hurd. Yeah, I want to thank our staff and, and also the uh, Martin County Forever uh, team. I think you've done a masterful job of creating ballot language and the supporting ordinance. I know that it was an awful lot of compromise. There was an awful lot of thought, <laughs> an awful lot of consideration. Every detail was was uh, uh, focused on, and, and I, I, the result is is uh, is is just I, is 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 terrific. Uh, I think that you you for the ballot language you selected uh, the two really important parts of this referendum. One is, to, is is acquiring land in order to restore and protect the rivers, and another is protecting ag. You know, um, we find that, that uh, well, I, I'm a, a cattle farmer's granddaughter, daughter, sister, and, and aunt, and I know how, how, what a struggle and what a gamble cattle ranching is, for example. You know, the market is either really, really good to you or it's really, really bad. And when the market is really, really bad, sometimes really, really good stewards of land are forced to sell <coughs> some of their property. And that's the last thing we want them to do. We want them to continue to do, to be good stewards of the land. So this um, takes into consideration both of those really, really critical conservation efforts. And I think, I think you did a terrific job. And I, I am in full support of the ordinance and the ballot language. Thank you.
Okay, with that, um, Commissioner Campy. That's what I like. Thank you, sir. Um, some of you are participating with us for the first time in an issue. To just reiterate the point that uh, in Florida, the Sunshine Law means that elected officials or even appointed officials that serve on the same board are not allowed to speak to each other outside of a meeting on something that we're going to vote on. So when I hear my colleagues giving their opinions today, just like you, I'm hearing them for the first time. And with that, I think that Commissioner Hetherington's point about the disposition of the players we all agree that agriculture is going to be a very large portion of this for two reasons. One, without the farms, there is no food. That sounds like a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's absolutely true. And the other advantage for us here in Martin County is we want the farms. Because if we are looking at conservation land that is environmentally sensitive, we protect it and then it's not developed on because as you've heard me say in the past, everyone that owns land, whether it's a husband and wife that owns a couple acres or it's a corporation that owns thousands of acres, everyone's thinking about what can they do with their land, uh, including farmers. So if we can uh, conserve uh, environmentally sensitive and valuable lands through this initiative, if the public so chooses to do that, good for us. However, some of the land is agricultural land. It's not uh, pristine, you know, ecosystems. It's, it's, it's our ecosystem. It's what feeds us. So to have four members of the board be environmental in a board of nine, I think, is a pretty fair representation. And if that last person, which I did hear the speaker say, and I did hear from my uh, county attorney, that it should be someone, I think that position, that philosophy could be represented in the four. And that if agriculture is truly as important as we believe it to be, it can't only be one voice out of nine. I think making one additional person be ag-related is appropriate considering we're thinking about environmental, environmentally sensitive land and agricultural land. How is such a big portion of this idea represented by a single person. Now, if it's someone like uh, Rick Hartman, that one person is going to be perfect. But if it can't be Rick Hartman, you need maybe potentially two people representing such an important portion of what we're looking to do here. So I would make that change and make that two for ag and take that last person out as my personal opinion. In regards to what Commissioner Smith has said, I don't disagree in his philosophy. I disagree at this particular time that if we start adding little stones to one side of the scale or the other, we're starting to muddy this up. Uh, and I think, yes, you do, when you layer in additional opportunities, bring in a new constituency group. But I think you'll lose people that would vote for this that want it to be very defined. And I think the great work that this group has done is to define it very specifically into these very specific categories and then put a you know, citizen oversight board in because some people um, don't want to be involved in the participation of these decisions. Some people don't want the commissioners, whether it's us or the next group, to be involved in those decisions. They want them to be community-based decisions. So. I wanted to tell our staff that if this is to be voted in by the public and all of the mechanisms that are being carefully considered are put into place to purchase either the conservation easements or the actual property uh, for those dollars that are raised through this initiative, that doesn't mean that the county is never going to purchase another piece of property outside of this. I still believe that in order to protect the green open space within the communities, as we did earlier this year in Palm City, as Commissioner Smith used an example about if you have the opportunity to enhance a park, Commissioner Hurd did it very successfully with Maggie's Hammock. She was able to buy from a willing seller with money incorporated from her district funds. Commissioner Jenkins just did it in Hobe Sound with the ham parcel. That should not stop 
the county shouldn't think, well, we're never going to buy another piece of property. This is a separate little opportunity for vast projects. So to Commissioner Smith's point, I would cons still consider that there are opportunities that will present themselves that will enhance the people that live in town. And so uh, I wouldn't support his decision of adding that into this. I think the more we start to, you know, shape it, it's going to get away from us. Uh, but I would agree with Commissioner Hetherington that we should flip that, as my opinion. Thank you. Commissioner Smith. Yeah, Commissioner Campy is absolutely right, unfortunately, because of sunshine um, and our state laws, we don't, I, I, we don't get to sit down and have that conversation. And so the only place I can do that is here. And I wished that I had done it three weeks ago when we had our conversation. And look, I, 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 I'm perfectly okay. If, if I didn't express my, my ideas and thoughts with our board, uh, I would forever not forgive myself for not at least having the conversation because if Ed said, hey, you know what, we could have used that to buy the piece of property in, in Palm City and we could have turned it into a park. That would have been a good idea. The problem with Ed's thought process is we don't have a dedicated land acquisition fund in our budget to go buy things. And if you all remember what we went through with Ed's uh, acquisition out there in Palm City, it was a hobbling together of all sorts of little pieces, parts, and components that made it incredibly difficult and incredibly hard to do. And so my thought behind this was if there was a way, but there's not, if there's no support, fair enough. But if we, if we had had the opportunity to have a couple million dollars set aside to do those kinds of things when something popped up, it'd be a great opportunity. And so um, I sense nobody else is jumping on the idea that there's not support for it, fine. I, you know, if I didn't bring it up here, it doesn't get brought up and it doesn't happen. And, um, <coughs> and that's it. Commissioner Hurd. If it's okay with you, I'd like to hear from Martin County Forever about the proposed changes. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, and thank you so much for your very thoughtful concerns. And um, we really have worked so hard to try and get this in a position where everybody agrees that it's going to be fair. I wanted to uh, remind everyone that this is the resolution that we're talking about, which is the makeup of the uh, Citizens Oversight Committee. So a resolution can be changed. Um, I, I, again, I don't know, uh, Ms. Woods, if you could read out who's on there. I mean, if I get it that we're all here together, if we need to add one more ag person and we can just get this done so that we can move on, um, we have a lot of work ahead of us to try and uh, raise money, to try and get this the word out to everyone. And my fear is that if we wait another month and we're not really sure, it's just so critical that we try to get this on the ballot. Um, uh, Commissioner Smith, I, I understand your concerns. Uh, we had looked at the, uh, the corridor with Jonathan Dickinson State Park to make it a super park. So we are concerned there, are, there is the ability to have other um, parks added through the acquisition of this land. Uh, we, and we're all on volunteers. <laughs> so, you know, this is just because we feel very strongly about this. Um, if we added land next to current parks, our polling indicates that this measure would not pass. Um, again, I understand your concern, but I, from my heart, I would really encourage you. I, I believe your concerns will be met. Um, I don't know if there's any questions that we have. We'd, we'd love to kind of clean it up today. Uh, we've talked amongst ourselves. We could add another ag person. The problem with that is that it takes it up to 10 people and now you kind of have a split. No, we're going to drop. drop. I, I suspect that I can hear something coming out of here that I suspect here in the next uh, few minutes that we're going to have a motion because um, I literally can hear it working um, <laughs> through him. Um, I also had a ranch. Yeah. Uh, you know, I also know there's a lot of greening. So hopefully we can finish this today. Yes. Right now. And, and 
there's the ordinance. We're talking about the makeup of the ordinance, not. Yes, we're only talking about the ordinance today. The resolution will come back at a later date, so that's important. Um, my my only um, recommendation is we do need to hear public comment. Yeah, I was going to do but, that while yeah. I was I was trying to sure. be funny, and then sure. you guys interrupted my comedy yeah. routine. Very funny. While here. while very, this very this is going here. on over here, that if we had any additional public comment, that we could uh, we could take that at this time. Is there anybody? Yes. And when you're, you still need to fill out the, the form when you're, yeah. Jim Snedeker here. Before you leave, it's not. I, I would merely say that we've spent a year and a half on this. Uh, the polling clearly indicated that we're on the right course as it relates to as it's currently constituted. Uh, we would recommend that we proceed uh, as it's currently been laid out by Attorney Woods. Uh, if it's deemed critical that we add an additional farmer, then perhaps we add two farmers because we don't want to have 10 and, and, and then have a tie break situation. So I would recommend that we stay the course, that we move it to a vote, and then we proceed forward. We, we have to get going with fundraising. Otherwise, we're quite frankly toast. Um, we're starting from, from really ground zero right now, and we've only been fundraising for the past two weeks, and it's going to be very tough getting the money we need in time. So I would ask that you please proceed as Attorney Woods has outlined, and thank you. Thank you. Commissioner. Is that I would move staff recommendation. Okay. Commissioner Smith. I'm going to move a substitute motion that we modify the the makeup of the categories in the ordinance to reflect um, uh, two members uh, from the ag community, ag interest, however you want to word that, Sarah, uh, and that <clears throat> that that last position be either blended in language or just add uh, just be. <clears throat> um, captured within the first four um, environmental categories. I would need to, for purposes of the legality of the ordinance, I would need to make those changes and we'd have to, the board would have to be aware of what we were doing for it to be um, voted, but maybe I should wait I to see if- I don't understand what you're saying. Are you going to do it right this minute? Or I can do it. Yes. I, I can do it this minute in the sense that the so we have not taken our yeah, you, thirty break. So you give me we want to take a ten thirty break. Give her ten minutes to don't roll your eyes at me. That was more of a head bob. Um, and then you seem to be flustered. So I'm not flustered at all. What, I, I'm, tr but what I'm what I'm seeing is we have a we have a, a motion the first motion wasn't seconded so this one wasn't either and neither has the the second motion so do we so let me reiterate my motion direct direct our county before we go forward would you like me to come up with some alternate language and read it to you I'm just well, I'm trying to understand what you're asking yes and I would modify my motion that we ask uh, our county attorney's office during our 10 minute break to see if that's possible to Add language or to correct the language in the ordinance that would the, that would effectively bring us to two members in the ag category and leave us at four members uh, in the environmental community. To, as a point, and then to bring it back Smith to us to, to to incorporate the the final category into the yes. ag community. Okay. And to come back to us after our break, yes, if that's possible. If it's not Absolutely. by the end of the day, even. Absolutely possible. Okay. Commissioner Campy, I guess we're going to have to make our folks wait another 10 minutes. I would have preferred that we took the final bullet point that said one member shall be appointed from an organization with dedicated mission to preserve, protect, and secure natural land <coughs> in Martin County. Take that one member, put it up onto the one that says one member shall be, can you, where am I missing? Well, you, 
I'm looking at it right here. If I might make a suggestion. This okay, take it. Walking the, watching the sausages be ten, made. You ten more minutes, could, and then if you, you can start the fundraising. If you would like to, you could reduce the four members to three. No. 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 You still have the one for the acquisition. You want the acquisition up in the four members. Exactly. It's the same effect. That's bullet point. Yeah. I, I think you could have the vote right now. I think most of us are thinking, take the last bullet point, make it an additional ag person, leave the four members of environmental. Change one to two. Just, that's eliminate it. The last eliminate the last bullet point and make one ag person two. End of the sausage making. I, I need... I need a few minutes to make sure yeah. that I can fold in the final one into the four. We are going to take a 10-minute break. Um, you need to talk to these people. Too. Yes. Excuse me. Give her a motion to do that. She wants a motion to do that. Action. Okay. Need one, do you? Would somebody second you Commissioner Smith's me. motion you to? She's good. She said she's fine. I, I I could take it as board direction. Okay. All right. Ten after. <laughs> right. Eleven, please. Look at this. Oh.
He's been here a couple of days. All right. Yeah. Welcome. He does look like George Andreasi, though. My God. Welcome back. Um, I guess we'll turn it back over to Ms. Woods. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, I've got the language up on your screen. It's highlighted in yellow. Uh, this should be a pretty easy fix. So the first section that begins with the number four and the second line after, third line, after the word restoring. If you go to the third line, we would add the word acquiring. So it will be restoring, acquiring, and protecting. Uh, now go down to the, um, the third bullet point. That would be changed from one to two. Num the number two in, um, in parentheses, we would uh, eliminate the word after the word from. So it would be two, two members, plural, shall be appointed from eliminate the word an, and it would be uh, from organizations with a dedicated mission to preserve, protect, I'm sorry, organizations with a mission focused on education, promoting, and protecting the interests of agricultural farmers and ranchers. So those are the changes that I believe would reflect the board direction. I do also want to add, just because... Um, I want to make it clear, we will, if this uh, ordinance passes, this will be filed with the Florida Office of Program Policy Analysis and Government Accountability, who will do a fiscal analysis, which then we will post on our website. So I just wanted to make that clear if anybody was wondering. Okay. And also, your revisions is to remove the last bullet point completely. Oh, yes, and to remove the final bullet point. So there would be only be three bullet points. All right, Commissioner Smith. Chairman, I would move approval of the uh, recommended language and the ballot and ordinance. Second. Okay. Um, Mr. Donaldson, did you have something before we voted? To no, I. It was taken care of. Thank you. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Smith, seconded by Commissioner um, Hurd. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Cool. Now we're going to go to our 1030 preset at almost 1130. Good luck out there. Which is, um, which is what? Bathtub Beach, the history of Bathtub Beach. If I can find it. Oh, department number three, staff's presentation on the history of Bathtub Beach. There we go. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Jessica Garland. They're excited. We're cheering you. <laughs> I'm Jessica Garland, Coastal Program Manager for Public Works. Today I will be giving you a historical review of Bathtub Beach, and then I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Kevin Bodge and Steve Howard from Olson & Associates, who will go over the engineering history of the Bathtub Beach. Bathtub Beach is a complex system. It is isolated from sand flow by a natural warm reef on the east, and it is also isolated by the man-made jetty that is on the south of the inlet. It is on a barrier island, but it is also a valuable reef ecosystem for us. On this slide, you will see side-by-side -side aerials from 1958 to 2023. You can see where the reef is in all these aerials by the wave breaks on the eastern side, or you can also see the actual hard bottom reef visible in 20, 2004 and 2007. There used to be a pier at the north end of Sailfish Point that is visible in the 1995 aerials, and you can also see the dredging that occurred in 1958. The north end of the park is, can be seen to be relatively stable in the parking, until the parking lot was expanded in 1994. 
Kevin and Steve will go into further details to discuss changes that were made to the beach template to assist with stability. Starting on the right picture, you can see how the large beach, how large the beach was and the pavilion and the north cro crossover are completely surrounded by dune vegetation. But after Hurricane Floyd and Irene had passed, the dune and crossover were severely impacted by erosion. As many of you may remember, in 2004, we were severely impacted by both Hurricane Francis and Jean that caused erosion all along MacArthur Boulevard and Hutchinson Island. In the right picture, you can see the lifeguard tower that has been completely undermined and the dune vegetation that is now the front face of the beach. On the left picture, you can actually see the pier in Selfish Point that is fully eroded under. After the storms, there was a large emergency dune project that occurred all along MacArthur Boulevard to restore the dune. This project was able to give stability back to the dune of veg vegetation and crossovers. In 2007, we had several nor'easters along with large king tides that caused erosion under the pavilion and lifeguard towers. You can even see in the third picture, the light pole fell over onto the beach. The sidewalks are undermined and we lost parking at the north end. This was the beginning of our emergency truck calls. In 2010, a dune restoration project was completed to reestablish the vegetation that had been lost previously. As you can see, modifications were done to the park amenities. The north crossover was removed as it had been damaged in the previous years. By restoring the dunes, we reestablished re and provided habitat for birds and sea turtles to nest on. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy passed along our shorelines, causing severe damage to our shore with her 20-foot waves. She never touched our shorelines, but we had water going from ocean to river across MacArthur Boulevard. As you can see in these pictures, the pavilion was completely undermined and we spent numerous days trying to protect the road. In 2016, we went back to the basics and designed a full beach nourishment project to restabilize the area and provide essential habitat for nesting sea turtles and birds. In 2016, Martin County also received its updated state approved inlet management plan, which now required 34,000 cubic yards of material to be bypassed north from the St. Lucie Inlet and flood shoals. You can see in the attached photos where when erosion occurs, the pavilion pilings are completely undermined and exposed to the elements. In 2018, there were 11,000 loggerheads, 250 leatherback hatchlings that emerged from this shoreline after it, it had been restored. 2019, Hurricane Dorian hung over the Bahamas for three days causing large, shore, uh, large waves to hit our shoreline and cause damage. In 2021, we did our bypassing project to restore the beaches after Hurricane Dorian. After all the storms, nor'easters, and king tides, staff applied for a hazard mitigation grant to instore shoreline stabilization to protect our infrastructure, road, and utility lines. In 2023, the seawall was installed on the western edge of the dune with a curved refracting cap. The wall is designed to be buried under the dune and the protection of last resort. The wall was put to the test in December with, when it was faced with 12 to 15 foot waves. The waves hit the wall, refracted back towards the ocean with some sea spray spraying into the parking lot. In February, we began our current beach nourishment project to restore the beach after the last few storms and to cover the new seawall. We are not done yet, but construction will be completed by April 30th. The biological monitoring before, during, and after any project is very important to us. In 2023, there were 20,000 loggerheads, 600 green turtles, and 10 leatherbacks that hatched from Bathtub Beach. We have Cheryl Miller and Coastal Eco Group who have been monitoring the hard bottom reef for over 20 years. 
This permit monitoring requires many additional things, such as how much the reef grows, what type of fish and other habitat is living on the reef, but we have also added, in addition to that, quarterly or monthly uh, drone surveys to see how many inches the reef is growing um, each year. We also do summer and winter hard bottom edge survey, edge mapping to measure the reef's width along with the drone survey. And then in inshore, we do seagrass surveys to make sure we are not damaging any vital resources in the lagoon. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Kevin and Steve for their section. Good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Howard with Olson Associates, uh, consulting coastal engineer to the county. And, uh, to um, I'll just give you kind of a 10,000 foot view of the, some of the engineering decisions that went into this project since at least 2016, where it became uh, more, more common and, and more, more uh, explicitly designed. A typical project along this reach extends from about R34 and a half, and, and those uh, points with prefix with R are just established survey monuments by the state. They're kind of evenly spaced throughout the state along the, along the eroded shorelines, and they help us uh, physically monitor things at it, it even points um, through history. Um, and it typically extends about 3,400 feet from the north end of Bathtub, or Bathtub Beach um, through Sailfish Point to about the clubhouse there. Um, it is permitted to go a little bit further down to all the way to R40 past the clubhouse, but typically the beach conditions don't warrant uh, fill placement that far south. A typical project since 2016 has required about 150,000 cubic yards of sand um, to be placed onto the shoreline. Um, but the most recent one, erosion was substantial, requires um, a little more than 250,000 cubic yards. And all of that sand has been dredged from several bar areas that are permitted within St. Lucie Inlet. You see six of them here. Three of them are associated with the Federal Channel um, and Impoundment Basin Infrastructure, um, the Selfish Point uh, Navigation Channel on the, the lee side of the island there and two interior flood shoal bar areas called A and C. And for this 2024 project, we're utilizing all six of them in order to get the sand uh, for, the, for the construction. Zooming in a little bit, now I've, I've rotated everything counterclockwise. North is to your left. Um, this is the, the template of the current 2024 renourishment. And it extends again from the north point of the park to, the, to about the pool at the clubhouse in Selfish Point. Um, you can see the delineation between the bathtub reef beach and, and Selfish Point portions of the shoreline. Um, zooming in even further to just specifically bathtub reach, reef park, um, we, I left the, uh, the toe of fill. That's the, the seaward most limit of sand placement there in the dash line in the water. You can see the extent of the seawall that, that Jessica mentioned just a second ago, who's uh, intended to serve as kind of the last line of defense for the roadway and the remaining parking lot. If we take a, a virtual slice through the south end of the park, we can get a, a little bit of better view of exactly what we're constructing um, for these projects. Um, to kind of orient you, seaward is to your right, um, landward obviously to the left. The project, uh, and we, this is a slice through, all the things shaded in yellow are what we construct, that's sand placed. Um, and that's, the template is, is constructed of, of three major parts. We have a dune that covers about 30 to 40 feet of, of linear shoreline out towards the sea, a flat berm at plus nine foot elevation that slopes down gradually, a couple breaks to the sea floor. And that extends the mean high water shoreline. It actually pushes the shoreline seaward by about 150 feet on average throughout the, the, the project reach. And in order to do that, you have to elevate the, short, the, the profile between 10 and 15 feet. So it's a substantial amount of sand in, in one section. And this is just you know, looking along a tiny little slice. So imagine that all throughout the 3,400 feet of beach. And that's a, what we're constructing at present. Now this is a, an aerial view from 2007 from the park. And this is the last one I could find where the, the parking lot looks the way it, it used to for, for a long time. It's very engineered and curvy and pretty. Um, by 2009, the uh, emergency dune projects were well underway. The parking lot was basically gone at the north end. And you can see the little piles of sand there in the central parking lot there in the, in the process of placing sand as, as this picture was taken. Um, in 2017, was the, this is a post-construction photo of the, the most recent full renourishment of the project. And you can see one of the design intents at this time was to keep that northern parking lot open. And we contracted with a, a master planning firm um, who helped us design this and, and try to, we really tried to hold the location and, and keep the full parking lot available. And you can see the constructed dunes, see where that, they're green because they've got a bunch of sea oats planted on them. They look nice and pretty. Well, it didn't last long. This is 2018 and the ocean's back at the doorstep. Um, all those freshly vegetated dunes are gone. Um, the northern parking lot is once again being used to stockpile emergency dune placement. 
and at that point, it was it was apparent to everybody that maintaining that northern parking area um, just wasn't going to be tenable um, with the current conditions uh, along the beach. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, sir. Just, so, I, as a reference, sorry, as a reference point, where the pavilion is, I think if you look at the two pictures, you, does your cursor work? Yeah. Okay. Um, to the south, just a little bit, where the the bigger that one. So, if you look at that, and you look at the Next slide. You can appreciate how much we lost or we lose. <clears throat> yeah, which, is, which is one reason why the seawall is where it is at present. Thank you. Uh, so this is a picture, a post-construction picture again from 2019 or immediately after another renourishment um, of the project. And you can see the north end of the park looks very different. The dune is much wider. Um, that north end, uh, the north uh, entrance to the park has been closed off. Um, we did, again, contract with our master planning firm to maximize the number of parking spaces that were remaining at the park uh, and, and reconstruct as big of a dune as we can. Now, how do we arrive at, at these kind of design decisions? Um, this is a, a plot of the cumulative volume change along the entire shoreline, not just the project shoreline, all the way from the north end of bathtub all the way to the jetty. And, and as this, this is as measured by surveys. Um, and as this plot goes up, that means that the entire shoreline has basically gained volume. As it goes down, that means it's eroding. Um, so you can see, and this includes all the effects of beach fills. And, and one of the main design precepts that we looked at is, is, you know, in order to know where you're going, you need to know where you've been. Um, so we went back and looked at the historical beach conditions, and we found that in 1982 and around 2002 explicitly, the beach represented a fairly healthy condition. The shoreline was at a, a point that appeared to be sustainable and, and relatively healthy, especially in 2002. You can see that line is, is pretty flat from the, the late and mid-90s. Um, so it, it had been uh, relatively stable for, for quite some time. So we predicated our current design on that healthy beach condition and maintaining it. And if you look to the right of the 2016 vertical line, you can see for the most part there have been some waves, and those are associated with erosion and, and sand placement. Um, we've mostly stayed about that zero line. We, we've been pretty successful in, in holding that shoreline with a, with a lot of uh, variability. Now, this doesn't tell the whole picture. As Jessica mentioned, there had been a lot of sand placed on this beach since, since the mid-90s. And the blue curve represents um, th that sand volume being taken out of the black curve, which it tells a completely different picture. If you remember, I, I just said, uh, when the curve goes down, that's erosion. Um, if you take all the beach fills out, uh, as of April 2023, um, the beach is at about a 1.4 million cubic yard deficit to where it was in 1976. So it's, it's significant. And something appears to have changed. It, if we take this curve again and divide it into three sections by time, um, something happened around 2002, 2003, and, and erosion severely increased. And what these dashed lines are, are linear fit lines to all these measured data that made up the black and blue curves that you saw before. And if we look at the slope of that line, that gives us the erosion rate for the entire shoreline. So from 1976 to 2002, it was a relatively stable shoreline, slightly erosional. You were losing a little over 3,600 yards a year on average. Uh, which is completely manageable and had been completely manageable till about 2002, 2003, at which point it took a sharp turn. Um, from 2003 to 2023, if we draw that same linear trend line, the erosion rate went from 3,600 to 59,000 cubic yards a year being lost off that shoreline. And if we do that same exercise after 2016, it increased again from 59,000 to 83,700. So it's almost a 25-fold increase over the, the <coughs> pre-2002 erosion rates. And that's what we're dealing with today. And this project's relatively new, so we're still learning about what, how it responds and what we can do to change it. Um, and, and also maybe what's causing it, which Dr. Bodge will talk about. So that kind of brings uh, to mind the, the question of, of, of what explains this increase in erosion uh, along this particular shoreline. And I'm Kevin Bodge, I work with Steve Howard at Olson Associates, been working on this project for about 10 or 12 years along bathtub sailfish and also additionally in the 1990s. Um, is there, I can't actually hear, is this mic it's good? Okay, okay yeah. thanks. Um, so in terms of trying to explain what the erosional processes are, it's like this used to be a stable beach. I mean, this, this thing was just fine right, through the 70s and 80s, and then the wheels have started to increasingly come off the bus with increasing erosion. So what are some of those uh, causes? As Jessica and others have mentioned, um, uh, a lot of thought is given the fact that uh, the effects of Hurricane Floyd, 
1999, and then the severe hurricanes in 2004 really dramatically changed the shorelines along the east coast of Florida, particularly in the Treasure Coast area, and probably had some significant long-lasting effect on all of our coastal processes. But that's 20-some years ago, and I'm sure that was part of the issue, but what are the other factors? <coughs> well, one that we really have to look at carefully is that of contemporary sea level rise. On your screen right there, is a graph of the, the measured average annual mean sea level at uh, your tide measuring station nearest to you, which is Lake Worth Pier down in Palm Beach County. There's a gap in the data between 1990 and 2010 when the gauge was down, but the thing that's pretty clear and evident is that there was a measured increase in the mean annual sea level of eight and a half inches over the last 35 years. That's equal to the entire sea level change that occurred over the entire century before that. This isn't projected. This is actually measured data. When you go to uh, another gauge a little further south, down in Virginia Key, same thing. You, you see this, this increase in the actual measured sea level over the last three or four decades. And it's interesting that you get this acceleration um, or, or average trend rate of about one 0.1 foot per century, a little bit higher than the prior century, up through about 2010. And starting after 2010 and 2012, the rate just really seems to have increased up to a kind of shocking rate of 3.6 feet per century when extrapolated. Again, that's over three times the historical rate over the last 2,000 years. So sea level is definitely rising, but the th and of itself, you would intuitively figure, well, that's going to cause more beach erosion, higher sea. But here, along this project area, the presence of the reef accelerates that. It magnifies the effect of sea level rise in a very non-uniform way. First, we know that the reef itself allows wave energy to come through. There, there's gaps here and there in the reef, particularly about the beach. You look at some of the wave patterns, <coughs> and you can actually see the waves entering in through some small gaps or low points, which are shown here by those yellow lines in this photo. You see erosion associated with it. But, but there's more. It's not just the gaps in the reef. The reef, of course, extends all the way along this project shoreline from the head of Bathtub Beach all the way down to the jetty, north jetty at St. Lucie Inlet, indicated by the yellow dashed line in this drawing. What you see here is a high-resolution bathymetric image as if we've drained all the water out of the Atlantic Ocean. The white areas near shore are actually deeper areas. So there's like kind of a slough or a trough that's a little bit deeper as you go from bathtub on the left to the jetty on the right. Now, this reef extends basically along the entire area of the shoreline, except again for a couple of these small little breaks. The reef does not penetrate the surface for the most part. It allows some wave energy to go through it. So a little bit of waves pass over that reef and that passes wave energy into this really narrow area between the reef and the beach. And that, that wave, uh, uh, wave crest, they, they pump the water up. They increase the water level between the reef and the beach. Now, normally, that water, which is pushed toward the shore, it would return back offshore, the undertow right, that you're always warned of from your parents when you were little kids. Well, it can't return back offshore here because the reef is in the way. It can only go one direction. The water can only drain southward. And so it flows from north to south along the entire shoreline until it reaches the inlet. Now, with sea level rise, even just a little bit, even more wave energy can get over the reef. And that further increases the amount of water and energy which is trapped between the reef and the beach, which further increases the amount of water that has to drain out of this whole area, like a river which is flowing from north to south, from bathtub down to the inlet. And it does flow like a river constrained between the beach and the reef, showing here by this red arrow. It only has one place to go, and that's the low weir in the rock jetty, <clears throat> of which you see scour through that uh, weir, a low point in the jetty, and, um, uh, and scour uh, on the other side of it. A little hard to see in this, this aerial photograph, but all of that flow has got to uh, rush along Sailfish Point and exit out what is now a 300-foot gap in the, in the jetty, and, uh, and that's actually all scoured out. It's gone from about, you know, 9 or 10 feet deep to 15 or 16 feet deep in, in that particular area. 
And that flow has increased not just from the significant sea level rise over the last 10 or 15 years, but also increased by the fact that that whole slot was narrowed. It was cut in half of its size from 2009 when the north jetty of the uh, inlet was, was changed by the Corps of Engineers. So we've taken this, this slot, increased the amount of water that has to flow past it, and also narrowed it down, constricting it. So we basically got this really impressive river of seawater, which is flowing from bathtub southward to, uh, uh, into St. Lucie Inlet. A lot of causes here, it's a complicated beach system, as Jessica mentioned, but it's just not straight old beach erosion and mother nature that's eaten up this beach. It's a combination of man-made fa factors, which are greatly amplified by the ongoing and significant increase in sea level we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years. With that, Jessica. If you guys have any questions for us, we will <laughs> gladly answer it. Thank you, Kevin, Steve. Oh, we had a question. <clears throat> That was a great presentation, <laughs> and um, thank you for that. And I just had a question. I feel like that we've talked about this at different conferences, and it would it would be nearly impossible to permit some kind of groin structure or something out there to limit to limit that energy. Is that so? I'll take that one because we're in the middle. We have a hazard mitigation grant from FEMA um, to do modeling to see what type of structures would even work out there. Um, so that report should be done later this year to see and tell us what will work. Um, so once that report is done, then we would even be able to know if a structure would work to s slow down the erosion um, and then go talk to the <coughs> permitting agencies to see what it would take to permit something. Right. It could be possible, and then you would go on to the permitting agencies to see if they to would have the consider or even permit. Yep. Commissioner Smith. Kevin, thank you, and thank you, and Jessica, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> um, to say the least, bathtub is incredibly dynamic. It, it is there. There are storms where we will lose 75 feet of sand, and three days later, there will be 75 feet of sand that pushes back in around the yellow house on the corner. It's just insane what happens out there. Um, <clears throat> I think to the to the structures analysis and, and what may or may not come back, years and years ago there were some sauna tubes that were placed out off of sailfish that didn't work. Um, mm -hmm. Some of these things work, some of them don't. Um, <clears throat> when we were, I, th I think post Francis and Jean, when we, we had lost everything out there, all those sauna tubes kind of became exposed again, and there were these huge, ugly uh, nylon things laying out on the beach that you couldn't remove because they still had some sand in them. And <clears throat> anyway, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you all did this. I, it, it, and, and I think if we could spend, and, and not maybe today, but if people watch and look, if you go back and look at the historical photos from the 70s till today, and, and you look at what has <coughs> changed out at Bathtub, in terms of dimensions from ocean to river, where MacArthur Boulevard wasn't and is, and, and how much it has changed over its history. Um, there were trees that were exposed after Francis and Jean. There were huge um, stumps that were still out there from decades ago that got unearthed. Uh, if you remember, which isn't necessarily pertinent to this, but it was part of this, up by the House of Refuge, there was unearthed a huge concrete fortification site that was something military during World War II that I don't think anybody had seen since World War II because it had been covered forever. Um, but again, it, it, it is just, it is incredibly dynamic. Um, and, I, and I think there's been a lot of conversation in the community about us building this uh, underground, if you want to call it, retaining wall to protect the infrastructure in the parking lot. And that really its purpose is to be the last line of defense. And if I have that wrong, help me if I, if I do. But <clears throat> instead of when all else fails, we lose our infrastructure, we lose the road, we lose the parking lot, we flood MacArthur, it is intended that, or it was intended, to stop that from happening. Um, it was a huge change in our philosophicalness of how we dealt with bathtub all these decades. Um, but I think for our residents to see what it is, what it can be, and how it actually protects what's out there is important. 
Uh, there's two more components left yet to do with MacArthur. We have uh, the elevation, I think it's about 18 inches, right, mm -hmm. of, of road from about a little bit south of the Wentworth House, which is the yellow house on the corner, uh, to the roundabout that is just about at the entranceway to Sailfish. Because uh, if you've ever really looked at it, there's quite a bit of elevation change between <coughs> and that little roundabout. And it'll come up, I think, to about that level <coughs> roundabout. Correct. And then the the seawall on the west side. <coughs> so there will be an equal, as maybe not exactly the same in design, but there will be a, a, a sheet pile retaining wall that will be on the western side of the road, eastern side of the river. Uh, there will also be a turn lane that will be configured into that, into Sailfish, that will help with traffic flow in and out of, out of Sailfish. Um, and, and just <coughs> and for all the public's n knowledge of this, this is really the first attempt of us, I think, in a major way to start dealing with how we approach and view with uh, water elevations and, and moon tides and everything else that is changing in our world, <clears throat> that it is a really good project as a, um, as a starting point. Um, and I've spoke to different agencies about it and spoke about it in D.C. that I think the challenge for all of us in Florida moving forward with what we're seeing relative to our protecting our infrastructure, whether it's St. Augustine or, or Miami, is the permitting side of all this. And the challenges of dealing with <clears throat> billions and billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure that sit on our coastline are built and are valued and used, and how do we deal with that and how do we protect that infrastructure moving into the future? And I think what I share with everybody is that the it, the understanding from the federal government and the state government in terms of, okay, we have all this stuff, how do we protect it? And, and how, do we, how do we affordably, if that's a, a word, how do we affordably do it um, to protect our residents and protect our infrastructure? So thank you for all the background, Kevin. I thought that was great. I, I don't know if, if I've ever seen that part of the presentation where there is the reversed for, force of what comes over the reef and then heads back down south but that would fully explain why the impoundment basin gets all of the sand that it gets because it's being carried down south <coughs> uh, uh, the barrier reef or the, the, uh, the worm reef. Um, and that too is part of the explanation. That was a huge project for us that when we built that impoundment area, it was to capture all that sand. Uh, and then the management plan was, okay, how do we redistribute it? And, and 10 years ago, I think, was the first time-ish, somewhere in that timeline, where we actually could take sand and move it back north. Yes. Uh, because prior to that, it always went south and, and went out to either Jupiter Islands and Palmont area offshore, or it was pumped down there. And so it's been a 30-year kind of process, if you will, to get to where we are today. But uh, there's some hardening still that we have to do to the South Jetty that's coming up next, right? In the yes, I'm actually going out with the Army Corps tomorrow. Okay. to take a look at it. And are there any improvements to the northern jetty or just the southern? No, it's just still southern. very stable. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Mr. Donaldson. Yeah, I just thought it was important just to point out a, a couple of things that are uh, on the shoreline. And first of all, I, I think the, the the wall that was built is similar to the one we did just uh, south of the House Refuge, which is behind the dune and um, uh, was necessary after uh, Hurricane Jean, in which we had uh, the, the island stripped away there. Um, but I think it's also really important to point out that, you know, the inlet, uh, having a navigable inlet in, uh, uh, in Florida, it causes a lot of erosion in stopping the drift both north and south, and that we were one of the first to get that bypassing to the north recognized. And part of that, what drives sediment movement is the waves and so when you have a lot of southerly waves which we've had some this year all of that sand that would be normally being pushed north um, is not getting there so so that uh, I think our inlet management plan is up to what 35,000 uh, I just changed last year to 36 36,000 cubic yards a year to so the inlet from our best estimate we know it's doing at least that much of um, um, of uh, preventing sand coming back in t into the system. Um, and the other, I think, really important piece is that uh, we, we did develop the county with uh, Sailfish Point as a relationship with this project. And so that cost share agreement, which benefited them in terms of, and, and that uh, 
and, and, and I think it's also unique is how much we're using the flood shoals that were created by the original inlet opening in the 1800s and, uh, and then continued to collapse until 19... 20 or something like that when the North Jetty was built. So there was a lot of sand that was brought into our estuary over uh, decades and decades of work that we're able to return back into the system by a pretty unique management strategy along with the impoundment basin. But I think that agreement with the um, with, uh, Sailfish Point is really important to point out that we share that 50-50 in terms of the local share. Um, and that's been very instrumental in our success of maintaining this um, beach very economically um, for the county citizen standpoint. Uh, and the last thing was just uh, as uh, being a, 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 the engineering side is that the, the sea level rise is very complicated as uh, Dr. Bodge pointed out in terms of where we are. There's also cycles where the average can go back down again over over a hundred year period and I'm certainly hoping that this current um, increase may level off and the decadal or the hundred year average may be closer to two foot per hundred years instead of three and a half but we we will the, the good thing is is that we'll know obviously the what you see on the ground is what's what's reality and and using actual data to make our decisions I think is the most important thing that we do here in Martin County is we talked about it with uh, with John Mail the other day so we're, we're a data driven um, organization on on real science so I think um, and that's what we'll continue to provide you thank you Mr. Campy. Thank you very much. I appreciate the sort of the new explanation, if you will. I had not heard it that presented that way. Um, this has been an issue since all of us have sat up here, some of us longer than others. Uh, I had always used the expression when people ask me about Bathtub Beach that uh, if you're in a tug of war with Mother Nature, she always wins. And I appreciate the decades of research and analysis and study but we're still in the same spot year after year or decade after decade. A couple of questions for you. One, you presented that there's sort of that wash down of water that comes over the reef, gets to the dune, it's got nowhere to go, it can't find its way back out because we have the worm reef. So it heads south and like rushes south, like you said, like a river. Then when it was narrowed, you can imagine that if it's narrowing, it's then forcing the water to move even faster. So that's washing out a lot in between the reef and the, and the dune, the beach. Um, I didn't hear a way to necessarily stop that from happening. Um, we did hear about sea level rise. So if we've been dealing with these situations for decades, and now we have sea level rise and this new situation. My question, which is a layman's question, is what would happen if we stopped doing anything? Because beyond the amount of sand that we have been pumping onto the beach, that's not the only thing. We've been pumping tons of money onto the beach. And I have, I'm sure my colleagues have as well. And remember, I represent Palm City, the whole county, obviously, but my district's Palm City, so we don't have as many ocean issues in Palm City. So a lot of people are saying when they read articles or they see things online that the county is continuing its effort to stabilize this very difficult to stabilize situation. Now, I have sat, as Mr. Donaldson said, I have sat through many meetings with our friends at Sailfish Point, and they write their own checks. They, they pay their taxes to the county, and then on top of that, the organization writes their own checks to be our partners. And they also allow us to mobilize on their property. They've been terrific. But they have a very vested interest. They live right there. So I guess my question to both of you is, I want to protect the infrastructure that is the road. Uh, and I think this new seawall is the first time we've heard of something that really could work and it's substantial. It's not just pushing additional sand onto the onto the beach and putting plants because Mother Nature can be ferocious. Um, what would happen if we didn't do anything? Uh, Jessica, um, so if you took the, the no action path, um, we've seen a little bit of, of what that would mean. 
the the beach, certainly a bathtub, would uh, for the most part completely erode. Eh, pulses of sand would come in now and then over the reef as it actually happens. But um, that that recreational nesting beach would be gone. The wall that was just recently constructed would uh, hopefully um, be there long enough to stop the flooding, although it kind of gets reduced because the beach also absorbs some of the wave energy and, st and reduces the amount of waves that are going to crash over that, that wall. Um, but, the, but the otherwise, the improvements at uh, MacArthur would, would try to hold that road in place. The erosion that occurs along Bathtub would then very quickly uh, cascade and fall down into sailfish. And so that erosional wave would extend uh, all the way through sailfish past 2001 um, in, in the clubhouse and, and then further south. Sand would still continue to, uh, to move down the shoreline through the North Jetty and into the impoundment basin and across the navigation channels. So certainly all that maintenance dredging would be required in order to pick that sand up uh, in places somewhere most of to the south, some to, to the north. So the bottom line is you, you would ultimately lose the recreational and, uh, and natural resource uh, along that entire shoreline. Sailfish Point would then um, uh, ultimately end up having to armor all of their shoreline because it really works as a unit. It's very difficult for Sailfish Point to maintain a beach solely along that shoreline, certainly one that looks like it has today, without joining it to the natural uh, north end head, which is Bathtub Beach. I think some other um, management uh, approaches to help mitigate some of the losses in the face of the, the rising sea level and the face of what the inlet condition is like right now are possible, and as Jessica mentioned, that those are look, being looked at in, in more detail to see, yeah, are they a good idea? May they work? And if so, are they worth pursuing? And the one thing Kevin kind of did gloss over is the sand still will move south into the inlet, and we have a state-mandated inlet management plan, so we will have to move that sand to the north. Um, so it, it still has to go north, even though we don't want to maintain the beach 34 36,000 cubic yards still has to go north per the state management plan. I guess the most important part I heard is that if we didn't continue to sort of fight the fight at Bathtub Beach, uh, we would severely be impacting our residents in Sailfish to the point of infrastructure uh, destruction. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I, I believe so. You'd have to armor all of that shoreline and construct some uh, pretty substantial groins and whatnot along along the Selfish Point shoreline in an attempt to hold even sand there at all, but it would not look like it, it does today. The one thing worth noting, too, um, I'm glad you mentioned that that partnership you have with, with Selfish Point. You know, it's, it's pretty unique. There's only two such beach projects that I'm familiar with in the state of Florida, actually we're involved with both of them, that are that are partnerships between the private sector and the public sector. This is one of them here in Martin County. The other one is in Nassau County between Amelia Island and the State Park Service. And so you really get a lot of leverage out of there. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And then additional to that, and Jessica and Don can speak to this more aptly than I, you get the leverage of disaster relief from the federal government. So we're getting a lot of money in from the state of Florida and, and from FEMA as well so that uh, the, the burden is, while well, the county takes the lead, and importantly so, the fiscal burden on the county is, is less than in many of the projects that we work with. One final point, thank you. Um, I guess more for our staff than for you two gentlemen. I think when we are messaging, we need to speak more of that the literal infrastructure protection of infrastructure because I appreciate the bathtub beach my family and I took our kids there when they were little and it's interesting because when you talk about how the waves would attenuate in and roll and make that channel there during certain tides you could the families could be out in the shallow water further out and then as you're walking back there's this big trench which is highly dangerous for a five-foot-tall wife carrying twins <laughs> go in below her head, one of the closest periods in her life where she felt she would die. So I get that it was also voted one of the best beaches in, around, and I get that. But I think eventually the residents are going to get to a point that it becomes such an expensive recreational amenity 
that that alone is not going to carry the day. However, if it's going to be a protection of vital infrastructure, including everything at Sailfish, that needs to be the message to the public that's writing these checks year after year because eventually you don't win. And so uh, I know that, you know, man can, can triumph over all environmental issues, but we've been at this a long time and we put a ton of money, more money than sand. Thank you. I don't know who was first. Oh, you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. Um, I, I, I just, the, just the comment is that we, in, in reality, we, we really haven't been at it this long a time. If you look at it, we didn't really start until after 2005, our first truck haul was 10. If you look at the Four Mile Beach Project, that started by citizens' input in the 70s, and we've been doing that since, uh, since the uh, mid-90s and been just successful at it. What's unique about bathtub is the, the natural reef, which creates this condition where it erodes episodically and Dr. Bodge has done presentation in the past of how it suddenly releases. But uh, I did want to say that just a reminder that the inlet itself, to have a well-flushed estuary and a deep inlet that, uh, that provides the flushing of our estuary is critical. And it is a big component of why this beach erodes, erodes in its current configuration. There's certain other configurations that if you didn't care about sand management and the North Jetty was completely plugged, you would have a huge wedge of sand probably covering a big chunks of, of the worm rock. And it would be a different dynamic and the South Beach would hardly starve. So it's, it's this balance of trying to manage a natural system with man-made requirements and our man-made requirements require an inlet to have a healthily flushed uh, estuary along with the recreation and economic benefits. And they're all tied together and they all happen to intersect at this one spot. So I, I realize there's a frustration sometimes about what you might spend here, but it is inextricably linked to all of those other components of the estuary, the flushing, the inlet. And it's just one small piece that we're paying to keep that whole system managed. Commissioner Hurd. Yeah, we, we need to be data-driven, and the data is, is, uh, is trending. It's not reversing mm -hmm. for the last two, uh, two decades. It's, it's, uh, it's, te <coughs> it's, it's reliable, and it's telling us that c conditions are deteriorating really, really quickly, and we're not getting any reversals. So we need to be aware of that. So from, from the 70s to 2000, we were seeing the volume change, the loss on the beach of 3,600 uh, cubic yards per year to now 87,000 cubic yards uh, per year. And sea level rise went from 1.1 feet per century to now 3.6 feet per century. Those trends are not going to reverse. So I think we're going to have to get realistic about what portions of the beach we're going to save and which we're not going to be able to save. Ultimately, we're going to have to make decisions. We're going to have to pick and choose winners and losers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple of follow-ons to, to all of what everybody has said. First and foremost, um, I would also say this about our Sailfish Point residents. Uh, they are the only that I know of, Kevin, and I see you guys at our conferences all the time. They're the only residents, I think, or only community that comes to our shores and beach conferences and supports, pays attention, listens, learns, does everything they know how to do to ensure that what we do as a county and what they do as a community is supported um, for beach renourishment. I, it is stand out that they show up every single conference and they participate. Not only do they do that, but they participate, as Don said, in a financial way. Um, and it should not be underestimated that the influence that they have on the state of Florida's policy direction relative to beach management as a whole that we do, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. Uh, Jessica mentioned in her comments uh, a couple times about the turtle hatchlings and how successful um, the environmental side of this whole discussion has been. We had a, a turtle expert here a couple months back. December, yeah. Uh, and she pointed out um, how robust our turtle population has maintained and become, uh, which for anybody that believes that what we're doing out there, no matter how much it costs on the environmental side of the benefits at all, we have had incredible amounts of turtle hatchlings and, and, and 
Um, historical data for that supports that, and I mention this every time about Ross Witham. Had it not been for Ross 40, 50 years ago doing what he did at the House of Refuge and doing his turtle uh, releases and whatnot, we still get tagged turtles from that time from when he was tagging them, um, and they're all over South America. They come as far up here and go back again. It's remarkable what is accomplished. Um, the other thing I would ask you guys to comment on, if you have that knowledge or understanding, there's also a, a fair amount of discussion relative to when we do these projects, how much damage we're doing uh, to the worm reef. And, and, I, and I would argue that our permitting and the requirements of what we do doesn't do that, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. If you can speak to that, if you are knowledgeable about that, if not, we'll, I know there are experts on our worm reef that, that can, but I think it would be I, I think it would be helpful for those listening and those watching all of this to know what is it exactly the re relationship from the projects that we do to the health of the worm reef and how we protect it and what are the what are the impacts if any also I'll, I'll start real quick Commissioner Smith um, the so the the fundamental design of the beast nursing project itself is um, to protect the existing worm reef. That is one of um, the, the principal covenants of the project we went into design is that we could not bury the reef directly or indirectly with sand. And so one reason the project, the size as it is, is we model it after a natural beach system. As Steve mentioned, we took actual um, beach profiles that were measured in uh, uh, like 1982 period of time, around 2001, 2002. Um, and the design of the profile actually emulates those profiles exactly. So basically said, look, this was a natural system. That is what we are going to rebuild. Nothing more than that to help ensure that the sand isn't placed. And then, as Jessica mentioned, there is a very comprehensive monitoring program that is performed by Coastal Eco Group. And I work with a lot of reef systems all around the state of Florida and throughout the Caribbean. And, and I got to say, it's, it's probably the most intensive or robust uh, data collection that is done uh, on a reef system to examine any changes in that system with respect to uh, anthropogenic or, or man-made activities such as our beach project. And Jessica or Steve, you can explain it better. So Cheryl Miller um, and Coastal Eco Group, they are out there almost once a month doing um, analysis on the reef. Um, we make sure that we have pre-project, during project, after project surveys, um, sediment analysis to see how, how deep the sediment is on, on the reef before, during, and after um, to make sure we haven't covered it. We have have not put the wrong size sand on the beach. Um, we do sediment analysis of the sand we're placing on the beach because the worms don't like sand that's too small. Um, and I, I, we're not joking, it's, um, it clogs the worm tubes um, and it will die. So there are specific areas of the beach that we can only put the sand from the Sailfish Point Channel um, on the beach. It has to be south of the bathtub beach parking lot or the Bathtub Beach Park limits because that sand is too fine to be inside the park limits. So those are the, the lengths we go to to protect the reef. So I, I just want the public to know, I mean, we, we, we do go to extraordinary... Extraordinary lengths to make sure that reef sure that is healthy. To protect that asset. Um, and I see Mark Perry in the background, and Mark has come up to us many times over the last 20 years and said, make sure we have signs. I would venture to guess that the people intrusion on the worm reef is more damaging to the reef because when you step on it, it kills it than yes. anything we do with our renourishment projects. Yes, yeah, stepping on it, carving your name in it, uh, leaving your trash on it is more intrusive than our project. And the last thing I would add to, to Don's comments, uh, and this is just I, I, to the state of Florida and the importance of our beaches as a whole, a uh, study from 10 years ago, the financial side of this is that for every dollar the state of Florida spends on beach renourishment, and that includes us, is an $8 return to the investment or to the stability of the state of Florida. And maybe that's not enough for some folks, but I, I, I venture to guess that there's a lot of things that we do in the state that we don't ever see that kind of return on that kind of investment relative to what we do, whether it's a state doing it, federal government doing it, us doing it, 
it is a huge asset to the state of Florida, and so is the infrastructure that it all protects. And the f and the, and the last piece of that is that <coughs> that dune and that beach are our second line of defense. The coral reef track, at least in South Florida, is the first line. The second line is the dune and the beach. And the wave action and, and the damage that's done to the beach is one thing, but if it is protecting what's behind it, uh, that is immeasurable. And, and so we continue to fight the fight um, and protect what we have. Uh, and for our residents and for our visitors that love the iconic reef um, and bathtub that we have, I think it's all well worth what we do. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Appreciate it. Jessica, thank you very much. You have really led the charge uh, and grown very well in this position that we've given you, and I congratulate you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And with that, we are going to break for lunch, and we will see everybody back here at 145. <laughs>